Do All right, well, I gotta I gotta interrupt you guys. Joining us on the line right now, it's all uh, part of the interruption. We can steal that line from ESPN. Is the former WCW Hardcore Champion and a guy that actually appeared on Raw, SmackDown, uh, and the original ECW. He is none other than Big Vito. Vito, are you with us? Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? It's great to have you on the show tonight, man. We were just talking a little bit of wrestling, and we figured we'd bring you on tonight and uh, get your take on some things. But first of all, we had you on last probably about a little over a year ago, and I wanted to get right, your you opinion. The Pavarotti of Hard Shots to the Body, the Paisan who's got it going on, that fly Italian guy from SI, the one, the only, Big Peter. <laughs> you got to love it. I love when you get in character, man. It's, it brings uh, the what best. What are you talking about in character? I say that every night when I go out to the clubs. I tell all the ladies, baby, you're looking like J-Lo. You're looking good tonight. Yeah. You've got it going on, girl. To get Paula after you, should be on American Idol. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. well, there's an opening now. Paula, do quit. Yeah, Paula did quit. Yeah. I wonder why that was. I don't know. We'll have to get into that another time. Uh, she's over-emotional. She, yeah, well, you, you can also call her a cokehead. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, between, you know, you know, first she's, you know, she's, you know, really good, and then she's crying, then she's fighting with the guy, then she's singing, she's not singing, she's putting on weight, she's losing weight. I mean, make up your mind. Yeah, she's a mess. She is a mess. But, but, I mean, you know, but I'll tell you what, it's going to be a problem, though. Out. It's going to be a problem on that show, though, and I'm not a big American Idol fan, but, you know, you get somebody out there who really, really sucks. They really bomb that night. And you get, you know, you get Randy going, oh, dog, that was bad, that was bad, and, and you know, Simon blasts them. At least you got Paula to say something a little bit sweet and tender so you don't feel like a complete and total jerk. But uh, yeah. I guess they don't got that no more. I guess not. So now they're going to have to find somebody else. Who do you think should be on American? I think they should bring Madonna on. I think that would be a good replacement. Madonna. Now, would she be any better, though, in terms of being a mess? Oh, yeah, she would. Madonna's got it together. You think Madonna's fixed herself up? I think Madonna would... would Spell ratings, or you could bring Shaq Daddy on, Shaq Diesel. Well, that would be an interesting one. But uh, but does he have any? Well, I guess he did do a couple CDs, didn't he? He knows his stuff, you and, know. And he does. And he does. So are you are you telling me that Big Vito is a Madonna fan? Big Vito is a music fan. He likes women who know how to dance, carry themselves in the clubs, and most of all. If you're Marissa Torme, you know there's a little special something, something going on there, if you read the internet. Ooh, really? Now, that, that anybody who saw The Wrestler has a special a new appreciation for Marissa Torme. No, no, no. You see, you got to take it from my cousin Vinny. My cousin, they, uh, there you go. She was cues a button, you know? man, wasn't she? Yeah, I mean, she was looking good. And all the girls from the Italian neighborhoods act exactly like that. Wear their hair like that, talk about their sisters, talk about how they want to be, you know, you know, a married sister, how they want to deal with the family, drink coffee on Friday night, order pizza, you know, the whole, the whole Italian thing, you know. <laughs> oh, boy, but yeah, I and go. i got to tell you, I grew up uh, not far from where you were. I'm uh, actually the other side of the river. I was out in Jersey, and, yeah, we had our share of Italian uh, young ladies. Yeah, hey, I'm sure you, you were across the river, and yep. you must have, split, you know, gotten a few of the bodies that I slid over that way. <laughs> we, I, we we've got we've got uh, I believe uh, I, uh, seventy percent of this line though is like uh, is Irish and fifty percent of it's New York Irish. So we're uh, we're we're all we're all uh, New York ethnic coming out of here. Yeah, so what are you stuttering for when you're talking? <laughs> I'm, I'm, why am I you're stuttering? Nervous. How am I stuttering? You're stuttering. I'm you're stuttering. I'm stuttering. I'm I'm stuttering. Pause, <laughs> Did we catch a few of your relatives by mistake? We're sorry. Wait, what did you say? Come on. Dude, what, why, why, why are we having the Italians sacking the Irish here, my man? What's up with that? Yeah, the Italians always have to pack the Irish because the Irish pay. Ooh. Oh, dude, you, yo, your mafia gets us to do the, the dust stuff work at Hell's Kitchen, my man. That's what the, uh, the Westies are doing. Yeah, but what else are you guys supposed to do? You guys drink, you have a bunch of baked potatoes, you drink. What else is that? Uh, we're we're fucking like uh, like rabbits, dude. <laughs> Did you say the S word on Catholic. great friend on a I, I curse like a sailor, dude? Yeah, he did say the F word. He shouldn't have done that, but thankfully we I, don't. Yeah, what are you talking about? We we drop it all the time. 
We're on the internet. We can say whatever we want. Yeah, you hear balls last week, man? Listen, you see, now do you know what I mean by you were stuttering? You're starting to curse. You're starting to bring up your mom. You're talking about your relatives. Relax, man. It's a family show. This is not a family show. You Have you heard this one lately? <laughs> This yeah, is not I got a family show. I'm telling you, my mom doesn't even look at it. But Brad Shaw's mom was checking me out in Playgirl Mag. <laughs> I gotta right. say, you should you should have been tuning in last uh, well two weeks ago. We had Balls Mahoney on the show, and oh my uh, God, he offered his opinion on uh, Michael Jackson, and I believe the phrase was that effing n word child molester. I'm glad he's dead. So yeah, well, we we got a kind of a rep here now. So, so this no, isn't no, no, a family no. show, to clarify. All right, if you bring it up to Michael Jackson thing, you got to look at the positive that the man brought into life, okay? He made beautiful music, okay? He took a bunch of kids off the street and he adopted people. He became a father to a bunch of orphans. You know, people forget that side of it. You know, and he donated money, made people happy. He did a lot of charity work. You know, and everybody reads into all the negative stuff. You can't believe all the stuff that you read. But when people are stepping out and they're doing something positive, you know, nobody ever gives them credit. So when people say, after this, and this guy did that, and everybody said, look at all the positive things people do in life. And that's the way you get the best, the best scenario and you get the best of people. When everybody thinks about the negative, that's just, you know, propaganda for the press, it's propaganda for, for news people, you know, radio shows, it gives them something to talk about. But how many times you talk about what good people do in life? Well, I mean, that's the like way. Madonna. You look at Madonna, right? She's got millions of dollars. She don't have care in the world. But she adopted a couple of kids, and she's trying to adopt a few more. Exactly. You're right. I mean, right, she had a like problem, guys, but she seems to have cleaned herself up, so. Yeah, I mean, look at you guys. I mean, I'm sure that you guys, I mean, you guys do the wrestling show. I mean, and you do it because you, you like wrestling and you do your wrestling. But I'm sure there are some qualities that you have that, you know, you do and you donate your time to that you probably don't bring up on the air. Yeah doesn't make you, you know, any less of a person, but people don't talk about the good things you do because you don't advertise it. There you go. There you go. You know, that's why, like I said, the thing about, you know, flow and survival, I mean, those are some of the good qualities of the kind. We keep a low profile and we just, you know, send it, out, send it across the river. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, boy. All right, let's talk about wrestling here. Go yeah, ahead. let's get to the wrestling. All right, so last time we had you on the show, we were talking a little bit about uh, your work with the NWE, and uh, I heard you have you guys have a tour coming up. We have a tour coming up in September. We're going back to France, and we're going to Malta. Uh should be another uh, great tour for NWE. We have a lot of good talent. We always put on a good show. We pack the houses everywhere we go. We never shortchange the crowd. We go out of our way. And we do everything to make everybody happy at the show. So, and everybody gives 150%. It's one of the best crews out there. Everybody loves to work there at the NWE. It's the place to be. And uh, hopefully, you know, with the economy and everything, I wish there could be more tours. But being that, you know, the state of the economy is worldwide. Cause I was just over in uh, living in England and working that territory. And they had a back, you know, they had a back up there booking schedule. And I wound up having to come home early from there. I mean, I was planning on staying there the whole rest of the summer. But due to circumstances behind my control, and it's just, you know, the way people are spending their money right now, it's just really tough out there. The economy is hurting a lot of ways. And unfortunately, it hurts the wrestling business because that's the way a lot of guys make their money. But, I mean, it's like everything else. Everything balances out for the good and bad. There's a tour going on. There might be a trip to Germany to, for Big Vito, even though he was Iron Man champion. In, in 1992, winner of the prestigious Ironman Hanover Tournament. We wrestled four matches in one night, come out victorious. And when there's, I think that tournament has been going on for over 30 years, and I'm one of 30 winners. And that's a very uh, honorable thing to do with German when you can win something like that. Absolutely. But, Plus, you might get to catch up with Alex Wright. Hey, Alex Wright is a good guy. When I was in WCW, he was, uh, you know, he was pretty cool with me, you know, and, uh, you know, it was all good. I mean, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I heard he's doing very well. I think he's he got a school. Yeah, he does have a wrestling school. You know, and when he got out of wrestling, I mean, he was sick for a little while, and, you know, he bowed out of the spotlight, but he was happy being home and doing his thing. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear he's doing well. Uh, I did see somebody did an interview with him a few years back, and he sounded happy, and he sounded like he was happy doing his school, and he was a good athlete. He was a really good athlete and did well there. 
So in WCW. Yeah, he did, he did too good. I mean, even though he did that, you know, everybody criticizes dance in there. But, I mean, it's something that made him popular. And, uh, you know, he, he, he wrote it to the end. You know, he got a spark. He got, you know, a good run with it. Yeah. And uh, he didn't say nothing bad. I mean, when you make it to the elite, when you make it to the top, you know, the big leagues in, in wrestling, and you have a career and you, you're on top and you're wrestling on Monday Night Nitro, you're wrestling on Monday Night Raw, you're wrestling all the top stars. I mean, you've accomplished something in your, in your wrestling career. You know, a lot of guys say they're wrestlers. Then you wrestle nine matches in nine years and they say they're pros. That doesn't make you a pro. Pro is when you work with the best and you're on, you, you, you wrestle night in and night out and you're doing your thing. And a lot of guys are not a lot lucky like me to have a wrestling career that's lasted 19 years. Let me give you a line. I was actually talking to, uh, Demolition Axe, the mask superstar, off the air just a few weeks ago. And he said, uh, the kid he was working that night came up to him and said he's been working for two years. And he said, yeah, how many matches have you had? And he said, well, I've had 30 matches. And he said, you haven't been working two years, you've been working a month. And I thought that was a great line. It is a line, but it's the truth. I mean, just think of it. You know, like in Germany, where I just came back from this tour of England, right? I was working six days a week. I went and stretched at nine, ten days. I was working every night. I never missed a beat. Went to the gym every day. Wrestled every day. Never cried about it. Loved every minute of it. Mm-hmm. And I helped all the young guys in there. I taught them stuff. I asked them if anybody who just wanted to work out before the shows, if I could teach them anything, if I want to learn anything. A lot of very respectful guys in England, you know, they uh, they picked my brain. There's a few of them. You know, who learned something, a few of them thought they were too good for their own britches, but then those guys are not going to go too far in, in the wrestling business. They're just happy to be in England, happy wrestling, you know, those small shows. And when you don't have aspirations to go to the big time, you know, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're limited, limiting yourself to what could be. Exactly. You, know, you want to be the best in there. You want to be better than anybody else. My goal is to be better than Kurt Angle, an Olympic gold medalist, you know, and that's my, that, that was always my goal, it still is my goal, he's an Olympic gold medalist, if I get beat by him in wrestling or anything, you know, I got nothing to hang my head in, but I went toe to toe with Kurt Angle, Olympic gold medalist, and I never backed down from nobody, I took on the best, and I fought the best, and nobody could ever say I ever called it in, you know, I gave my all every night, and I still do. No, oh, I mean, I remember distinctly, you know, to really make a name for yourself. I remember the complete whomping that you took from Sid Vicious in ECW. Yeah. And, I mean, you just, it was a hell of a performance. You, you, nobody can say you phoned that one in. You really gave it your own air. And the best thing about that night is people say I took a hell of a beat. They said, Vito, if you would have hit him back, it would have been one hell of a fight. <laughs> <laughs> probably would have been, probably would have been. So last time we talked to you, you also were talking about writing a book uh, about kind of like a diary uh, from wearing the dress. Is that still in the works? Is that released? No, it's still in the works. It's just um, right now with the way the economy is, uh, the people publishing the books, everybody, I'm talking everybody, they took, everything took a back scale on the publishing company we were doing uh, business with sold their rights to another publishing company, and the 10 companies who were working trying to get the rights to the book, they all merged or they, some of them folded, and that's not anything bad. It's just the way the economy is. So trying to get a book and get a good price for it and get money up front, I mean, nobody's really doing anything right now. So the book is on hold. I'm not ashamed of it. It's, it's just about complete. And, uh, I mean, there's... A lot of good things in there, a lot of good stories, a lot of stories I could add. So, I mean, I mean, the longer I have to wait to put it out, you know, the better it is, the more, more stuff I can put in there. And uh, I'm sure when, once it's done, it'll be, it'll be a good read. Absolutely. And i got to throw this story at you, and I don't want to offend you, but it, was, uh, it came from a Lance Storm shoot interview. And we yeah. never did ask you this before. We've had you on a couple of times, and we never did ask you this, but... One of the comments he, he made was about uh, the day you were hardcore champion with Chavo Guerrero, and apparently uh, you went to Chavo, who was going to lose the cruiserweight belt that light night, and said to him, this is your last meal with the belt, enjoy it. And apparently uh, some people thought that you maybe took the holding of the belt a little too seriously. Now, I personally would think it's a very big honor to hold a championship, but uh, what, do you, what do you think of that people who may have 
you know, thought you took holding championships like the hardcore championships and the tag team championships too seriously. One thing Paul dangerously told me, he said, Vito, you know, if you're going to be a champion, champion has to have responsibility. When you have the belt, you have responsibility. So, you know, taking pride in being a champion, especially when the company puts your face on it, mm-hmm. there's nothing like that. You always have to uphold it. If I made a comment nine years ago and did it in jest and, and I'm friends with Chavo and right. no hard feelings are taken, you know, what's the beef? But if people are going to talk about a comment that I made, that means I made a hell of an impact on some people in their lives. So, I mean, that's all good. Lance Storm, he's a great guy. I got nothing bad to say about him. If he remembers one of my famous comments, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Terrific, terrific. And, you know, you were uh, honored with some of those championships in WCW. You held the uh, the Cruiserweight Championship. Uh, not the Cruiserweight Championship. That was WWE. Sorry about that. You held the Hardcore Championship and the Tag Team Championships. And right. uh, I mean, and you know what? Uh, fighting Lance Storm the night and the night I had to give up, and the night I lost the title, champion versus champion. That was probably one of the best champion versus champion matches we ever had. And I said, this, I said, and I'm proud enough to say, when I told Lance Storm on that night, and you can go on YouTube and find find it. Lance Storm, everybody knows in the building, you can't kick my ass, and that still goes. <laughs> And that was one of those gold things that happened at the end of WCW. You know, while the magic of the NWO was gone and, and Goldberg had, you know, kind of fizzled a little bit in popularity, there were still some great things happening in WCW that a lot of us still, you know, wish we had to look forward to. And unfortunately, WCW obviously has since closed. But did you think that maybe there was ever a glimmer of hope that WCW could recapture the, the magic while you guys were still there? Because you were really doing some interesting stuff in 2000 and 2001. But you know what it was is a lot of guys who were in charge and a lot of guys who who wanted to be, you know, the boss. And I just think it was a lot of, uh, you know, superstars who maybe, you know, wanted to do things their own way and forgot that we were a company. And the guys who were underneath them who were ga- gaining steam and joined the ride, I got nothing bad about bad about the city of WCW. I mean, it gave me a chance. I, I made my name down there. It gave me, you know, my first taste of the, of the big the, the big time. I became a champion. You know, I wrestled Kevin Nash on Monday Night Night Show in the main event. I was on pay-per-view. I wrestled Flair and Luger in their prime in WCW. I got nothing nothing but great, great stories to say. I mean, you look back and it was an experience of a lifetime. And, you know, I got to be with the big boys and I wrestled the big boys. And I was one of the big boys. And I still am. And I never, and the one thing I always gained from them, the only thing, one thing I always wanted was to have respect for my peers. And I, that's one thing that I always have, and I always will, will have until the day I die, is respect for my peers. Guys, we all here? Yeah. Very good, very good. Okay. Everybody else got kind of quiet for a second there, so I want to make sure we were all still on the line. Uh, uh, sounds like it. I got disconnected for a minute. You yeah. did? Oh, Eric? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So what were you going to ask, Patrick? Oh, nothing. I was just <laughs> I'm just watching the switchboard right now, make sure everybody's still on the line. Oh, good, good, good. We had got, we kind of got quiet there for a second, Vito. I'm sorry about that. We just want to make sure everybody. That's because still... the switchboard is lit up like a Christmas tree because they know Big V from Staten Island is on the line. Why don't we start okay. taking some phone calls? Let's see what interesting questions we have for tonight. All right. Well, why don't we uh, put out the number? The number, if you want to give a call in and ask Big Vito your questions, the number to call in is three four seven two three seven five six nine one. That is two four. Uh, that is three four seven two three seven five six nine one. And if you give us a call, you can ask Big Vito your your questions. No unregistered calls will be accepted. You must be calling from an actual phone line. We will not accept Skype calls because that just opens up the lines for pranks. Uh, so anyway, back to the questions we were, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit on the phone earlier about um, the FBI, and right. there was the FBI and ECW, and that was you know, uh, Guido and uh, who later became Nunzio and so forth, and there was a myriad of them. But in WWE terms, the FBI absolutely had to include the full-blooded Italian, and that is Vito. And well, let's uh, put it this way: if we ever put the the original. The original, like, you know, ECW never went on, on, you know, prime time, you know, and they, and they were a good company and they got great exposure and they did the FBI in, um, 
in WCW. But when Johnny the Bull and Big Vito became the Mamelukes and the Italian thing on Nationwide TV, TBS, and that's when we took off and we, we had probably one of the best runs as a tag team that you could have in a short period of time. And if I had one thing I want to accomplish in wrestling this life, that's to get back together with Johnny the Bull and have one more run as a tag team because I think we, we still, and I say it every day, we're still the best tag team out there. Even though we haven't been together, that's one tag team people would want to see and one tag team that would give a hell of a fight to anybody because we don't back down from nobody. We're two tough son of a bitches that can fight. And everybody knows that when Big Beetle and Giant Bull get together, you know you're in for one hell of an evening of entertainment. Absolutely. Now, one thing I want to ask is that it seemed like, I don't remember what the timing was, but it seemed like there, was, there actually was a point in time in the WWE where you were both there, but then they just kept you separated. Was there any reason why they never wanted to do the Mamelukes reunion? But they never had us there at the same time. Johnny the Bull had come in for a tryout. He was backstage. It was just me and Nunzio. And, you know, there was a chance possibly that he was going to come in and he was going to be Nunzio's manager and Big Vito and Johnny the Bull getting back together again. But he never materialized. But if you ask a lot of people out there and you put it on the website, you say, if you wanted to see that tag team get back together again, could they make it and could they be champions? I bet you 75% would say, Hell yes, twenty you know twenty percent would probably say hell no, and five percent probably say go ahead and book it. All right. Now, now Vito, when you were when you were working with WWE, what was the backstage environment like? Was it harmonious? Was everybody uh what was what was basically what I'm trying to ask is what was the difference between the WCW locker room when you were there and the WWE locker room during your stint? There was one boss, Vince McMahon. Ooh. Gotcha. Is that pretty much the uh, the end all be all of that conversation? That that just says it in a nutshell. Everybody knew Vince was the boss, and if he went, didn't go through Vince, he went through Stephanie, and Vince had the final say on things. And we all knew who the man was, and I respect Vince McMahon. He had he's the most creative guy I ever met, and if he could do it, I could do it. And if Vince could go on and do a hardcore match and get his head cracked open, Big Beetle can go on Christmas on a Christmas uh, Christmas pay-per-view and eat the most worms in in the boogeyman's history of shoving worms in people's mouths, which nobody has topped yet and nobody has ever got got that many worms in their mouths. So and after I did it, ain't nobody ever attempted that one again. Wow. Well, that's... Can't top the best. Absolutely. And, when Vince, and, Vince, and if Vince can go out and do certain things and jump off a scaffold, Big Vito can do it. If your boss can do it, you can do it. Anybody who says no and your boss goes out there and he's a multimillionaire and can do it, and you say, no, I can't, then there's something wrong with you. When they say, Vito, can you wear a dress? Hell yeah. You tough enough? Absolutely. You afraid? Not afraid of nothing. You think there was any, there was any kind of uh, doing that to humble you at all, or was that just, you know, big, tough Italian hey, in a dress? Let's put it this way. If they did it to humble me, right, humble me in what way? I went out there and wore a dress, and there wasn't one guy who ever challenged me to a fight. And if anybody ever said anything, how would you like to get beat out of you by a guy in a dress? <laughs> Fair point. And I'll tell you what, that, that, point. that was That's very... why it's the toughest man to ever wear a dress, right? And when I put it on, I left my house, and I said, oh, hey, it's going to happen. One-on-one -on -one ain't nobody going to challenge you. Four against one, five against one, you might run into something. You're going to go down, but you're going to go down kicking the shit out of somebody. Exactly. Now, exactly. And, and I have to say, much respect to the WWE locker room, because nobody ever gave me a hard time about it. They all thought I had the biggest set of cojones that ever lived for doing it. I got much respect because I actually capered and lived the gimmick, lived it to the full. And not too many people would say they ever lived a gimmick like that, especially in this day and age. And I take a lot of pride in that, because I live, breed, eat, sleep, wrestling, I always will. Anybody could be going to do a match, but when you have to live a gimmick 24-7, travel in an airport, travel on a bus, travel in a car, travel, in, travel your life and live your life like that, that's something that nobody could ever take away from you. That says you are, you are comfortable with yourself. You're more of a man, and you have more self-confidence than anybody could ever put a label on, and that just says that you got you know no issues about who you are in life. Now do, you, now, do you think that would help some of the younger wrestlers that 
kind of just put on the gimmick when they're about to go out to the curtain, and they don't really live it away from the ring. You know, when, when they when they're done, they're not they're not you know that person we see on TV. Do you think that would help the perception of wrestling or help fans suspend their disbelief if when they actually saw this person, they were a lot like the person they saw on TV? Well, I mean, you know what? They tell you to watch the monitor and watch the matches for a reason. They tell you that to learn and watch and see how the pros work. If guys don't take advantage of watching how a person, a professional, carries himself, it's bad on you. But if you take the time to watch, you, you know, I'll tell you what, in a good story, Big Vito, when he first started out, he was ruthless. He could back up what he said. He was too good for his own good, and he needed to be humble back then. And what happened was, you know, Paul Lee came to me one day. He says, Vito, he says, do you see Bret Hart acting like that? I said, no. He said, you see Sting acting like that? He, goes, and he said, you're just as good a wrestler as them guys. He said, but the only difference is, is that they carry themselves different than you. He said, if you work hard and you stay humble and you, everybody knows you're good, Vito. Everybody knows you work hard. Everybody knows that you can do it. It's just a matter of putting your mind at ease and relaxing and being humble. And that's the reason I went to ECW. And that was the best move I ever made in my career. Because I work with all the, the young guys, the Chris Chetties, Danny Dorns, the Novas, the Blue Meanies, and I work from the bottom up. Even though I knew I was better than everybody else, and I was just as good as the main event guys, I still did it, and that's being humble. And then when I worked my way up the ladder from ECW, that started to teach me how to be a pro. And I'll never forget that as the best experience in my life. And Taz and Paul Lee gave me a chance, and I always give them props. But if it wasn't for them guys giving me a chance, I would have never made my career what it was. Now, I appreciate that chance. Absolutely. And now, Taz, you mentioned Taz. Taz is now down in TNA, and you did a, you had your stint there with the New York Connection. And basically, what I wanted to find out from you is, what's the potential of you heading down to TNA? Because if I'm not mistaken, even though we all associate you with Staten Island, you're also in Florida now. Right. Well, I mean, TNA, right now they're going through a big thing. I don't know if it's true about Kurt Angle's wife and Jeff Jarrett. But, I mean, if if the story thickens, which I really don't know, I can just go by what I hear, the hearsay. But, you know, Dutch Mantel and Savio Vega got let go. Yep. They're Jeff's boys, and Jeff hasn't been at the pay-per-view or any of the shows. Seems to be some friction there, so... You can only go by hearsay, but I don't believe hearsay because sometimes hearsay is a bunch of BS. Exactly. So I talk to somebody who's there, I really don't know. As far as the guys who got let go, sorry they lost their jobs. Nobody needs to lose their job. You know, and as far as, you know, what happens in people's personal life, I always said that should stay in people's personal life. It shouldn't be made for advertisement on the outside world. If A and B want to get together, that's their business nobody else's business. And if people learn how to mind their business in life, then a lot of things wouldn't have to happen. Right. So are you in agreement with me as well that uh, with TNA going through this transition, if they make it a work shoot, if it's all legitimate and, and all this is really going on, do you think that there may be turmoil back there right now? That could be. you got to remember something. There's a lot of turmoil on TNA because, you know, guys are not making – you know, top dollar. A lot of guys are finding it hard to survive. You're on contract, and you only get paid when they appear on TV. So, I mean, everybody's trying to fight for a spot. So, everybody's living, except for the guys who are the top guys and making money. Everybody, you know, on the, on the undercard, you know, is finding it hard to, you know, to get on and get, you know, make a living. Same thing with the guys in WWE. Top guys are making money. They might not be making as much. But the guys on the underneath card, they're finding it a little hard because they can't get a spot on TV. If you don't have a spot on TV, you're not going on house shows. House shows make you money, so you're only living on one TV a week. It's very tough to live, you know, on X amount of dollars when there's no room for advancement, where they're not giving you a push. And in TNA, they seem to be focusing on the main event mafia, a couple of matches on the under, and that's it. Exactly. You know what I mean? And, how, and they have a whole roster full of guys who sit back there. That's why you see um, six-man tags. That's why you see 
a bunch of guys doing run-ins. That's why you see a bunch of false finishes. That's why you see a lot of guys involved in some things after the main event show. And I think there's three shows. So yeah. at least some, at least everybody gets a little bit. Then on the house shows, I mean, their own TNA is only drawing, you know, five to a thousand people, five hundred to a thousand people on the house shows. And overseas, of course, they're going to draw because they're going overseas. But over here, you know, they're really not drawing that good. You know, they're going in a five thousand seat arena and they're only drawing less than a thousand. That doesn't make a packed house. Yep. You know, attendance is down for WWE as well. I mean, not everybody's drawing. Economy is hurting. You know, but. You know, guys, uh, you know, some guys are working twice on the card. Some guys, you know, not everybody's, you know, making the money. A lot of the top guys are staying home so these guys can go on the road and make some, make a little bit. But if the top guys are not on the road, then they don't draw the houses. So, I mean, it's a catch-22 scenario. Now, I did want to ask you, uh, NNA is doing phenomenally well, uh, right. despite the fact that WWE and TNA are not. And my reasoning is that, to a degree, MMA is kind of, taken wrestling's formula where you really, really want to see a match and you don't see that match until the pay-per-view. Uh, that is, that's about where the beginning and end of the comparisons, I think, can, can start and finish. What do you think of MMA and do you think that it is a threat to wrestling or what do you think of it? Oh, the MMA is a different sport. It's a different type of fighting. The only matches you do see are on pay-per-view. You don't get it. You know, the only thing you get is the ultimate fighter. And, you know, Kimbo Slice is going to be on. That's going to draw ratings. It takes you all the way to the end. You know, I mean, that, that show, when he's got to fight for the title, will draw the biggest ratings. If he wins, his first fight in that pay-per-view will sell quadruple what everything else sells just because he made it. So they've taken a chance, you know, I mean, them giving, him, them giving Kimbo Slice a chance. But they reap the great benefits financially. If he succeeds, because the six-figure contract they give him, whether it be a hundred thousand or a hundred and fifty thousand, compared to the five or six million they're going to make on him, is nothing. Wow! Yeah. You, you, you take a look at the map, and if they're going to draw an extra two hundred thousand buys because he's fighting, two hundred thousand times fifty. You do the math, and he's making 150000 If he has match in the night, he makes 60000 If he has knockout in the night, they give him another 10000 If they give him another 10000 for 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 a win, he will, what does he walk away with? Eighty grand on on a million dollars? There you go. W- wouldn't so, you mean, say, though, especially who, after... I'm sorry. Well, wouldn't you say, uh, Vito, after the... Uh, after UFC 100, especially with the tirade that Brock Lesnar now as a villain is UFC's top draw. Absolutely, he was the top draw. But he was the top draw beforehand because everybody wanted to see if he could sure. see if he was legit. Now that they added a little attitude, now he has to be double prepared because if he loses, he's got more to lose than the next guy. If he just was on his regular keel, I mean... Yeah, he would draw, you know, like when he lost to Frank, everybody was shocked. If he lost now, I mean, it would be the ultimate, oh, my God, you got your ass beat, you S and S, and you talk so much crap. But when he comes back to fight and they they see that he wins and then they put him in a title fight, they're going to make money with him. So he did justice by what he did. He didn't do justice because... The MMA is not that type of thing. Randy Couture never carried himself like that. Chuck Liddell never carried himself like that. Even bad boy Tito Ortiz never carried himself that bad. You know, yep. and but, when, but, you, but it, when you fight like that, it's a gentleman's sport. You give accolades to the guy. You might get a little carried away after a knockout, a little show, but then you're humbled and say, you know, thank you for my team. I appreciate the fans. It was good to be here. You know, I'm going to go to a party. I'm going to have a good time. Blah, blah, blah. But for the one night of glory that those guys have and the hours of training they have to do and the months they have to prepare for one night, yeah, you're going to spill a little venom. And Brock Lesnar, I mean, that Frank Mir was talking trash to him the whole time. I would have went up to him afterwards and said, yeah, now what do you got to say? Yeah, now you got your, now you got your ass handed to you. So now who's the champ? What do you got to say now? Want me to knock you down again? And that would have been it. But, I mean, he went total, you know, 
I mean, he went totally ballistic. And the one bad thing I think about the whole thing is that he knocked uh, the beer the beer company, yep. one of the sponsors. Yeah, yeah. That was a little overboard. Uh, yeah, and I think Dana be... White felt, felt the same way about that. But, but I mean, I, you, I, I agree with you. And I think from an economical standpoint, whether you, you like him or you hate him, the majority of fans are going to say, you know, they're going to tune into his fights. They're, they're going to say, hey, is that guy going to get knocked out? Can anyone beat him? He's going to have that villain role that wrestling used to have where you'd pay to see the villain get his ass kicked on pay-per-view. Well, I would have, I would have definitely put, I mean, I, didn't, I don't know if uh, Feta signed with UFC. Did he sign? Does anybody know? I don't. I don't know. Uh, I honestly don't know. I don't follow. Uh, here's, a, here's a scenario that I would have put. Lesnar is the champ. Feder is supposed to be the greatest fighter of all. But yep. the one fight Feder never fought was against Randy Couture. I would have put Feder against Couture to see who is the best. If Feder wins, he beats a top-notch, you know, fighter in Randy Couture. Maybe they all say he's a little over the hill, but he's still one of the best. If Couture wins. It's a win-win situation because he beat, that means Couture beat the best in all the nonsense that went on for years that they said that Feder was better than Couture. Couture beat him at 46. Couture now gets another chance at Lesnar after he lost to Lesnar. Now he knows how to beat him. So now who would you put your money on? You're putting money on Couture because now he's got the veteran savvy to say, okay, now I know how to outmaneuver this kid, you know, shuffle his weight a little bit and not let him bull rush me and get me down. And, you know, maybe it's that one quick right hand that knocks him silly like when he fought Tim Silva, and for the next five rounds, Couture ate him for lunch. You know, all you got to do is get hit once, and you're on Queer Street. That means you're lunch me for the rest of the night, fellas. Like that Rampage Chuck Liddell match they had uh, a few years back. Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, Chuck Liddell, I mean, he is, the, he is one of the best. He's just, he's you know, off. he ran his luck. He, he played his thing. He partied. He did it. He got a little carried away. He thought he was invincible. He got caught. Came in fat for that Rampage Jackson fight. Came out of shape. But when he came back to fight again, he lost his edge. Yep. That was yep. the difference. Now, do you agree with Vince McMahon, though? Because Vince McMahon says in interviews every time he's asked about it that he doesn't view MMA even as a potential or partial uh competition. But when you look at UFC, UFC's regular pay-per-views, not necessarily just the huge ones with the big title fights, are drawing roughly what WrestleMania did, which is obviously wrestling Super Bowl. But you got to remember something. Vince is always going to say that, just like he did with the Donald Trump thing, That's just like he did with the Lakers and the Nuggets. He's going to play it up to where, if there is a confrontation to where Dana White wants to mix it up one time at WrestleMania, come in and put one of Dana White's boys with one of Vince's boys, you know it's going to be a knockout, drag-out fight. And one of Vince's boys better be in top shape because he loses. He's going to lose the, He's going to lose everything. But if Dana White's boy come in, you know he's going to eat some lunch. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about the two rival companies. And out of WWE, who would you put against Brock Lesnar? Uh, let's see. Who would you put in there with Brock Lesnar? I mean, I mean, wait, is, this, is this a shoot fight or a, or a work match? Regular shoot fight. Oh, Regular. um, uh, I don't know who they have that's like legit right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe I put Hunter in there just to watch him get his ass kicked. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. You can't take. You can't give that to the son-in-law. You can't do that. You know. Oh, I yeah, love. But I mean, he's, he's not. In. Yeah, I mean, not. who would you? Who would you legit put in there? The biggest uh, guy I don't know. Is big, big, big show, big maybe, show. but for the first big back, show, yeah. maybe. I, I can't think of anyone. Shelton Benjamin is a good amateur wrestler, but he's not the size of Brock. No, Brock. You have yeah. Charlie Haas, another good wrestler, not the size of Brock. You have John Cena. He's not a wrestler. He's the, but Batista oh. is not a wrestler. I don't think he can hang with Brock. If, you know, if, if on, was, on that if, kind of. If it's What's TNA, I, I, that you, uh, they, they, and this is a fight that I think they're they're trying to push for in MMA at some point, you put maybe Lashley in there. Lashley against Brock. I mean, Lashley just needs to get some fights under him. Lashley, if you're going to see him fight, he's not going to lose in TNA. He's only going to come in, do walk-ins. He's going to do a couple squash matches. He ain't doing sure. nothing to damage his credibility in MMA. 
he loses a wrestling match, how can he go out and fight MMA? Fair point, fair point. He actually just had one against Bob Sapp, and apparently he won. Uh, I didn't he won the Bob Sapp one. Everybody knew that was good, that was going to happen. But Bob Sapp, he's a friend of mine. He, you know, Bob Sapp is an entertainment piece. He's a big man. You know, he could fight. But I mean, Bob Sapp, you know, he's run his course in Japan. That was a name to give Bobby Lashley. Now Bobby Lashley moves up the ladder. So now, who else do you give Bobby Lashley right now? Who could you feed him right now? Who would be a good fight? You can't put him in there with Brock because Brock's the champ. He's not signed with UFC. But who would you put him in there with? Jeez, I don't even have a clue. Yeah, I mean, we're we're not we're not as deep in, in MMA as probably you are. But I mean, we know the big names, but I I have no idea. But if you had to put somebody in there, right? Tim Sylvia just got knocked out by Ray Mercer. Right. So I mean, that's that's a wash. You got Tito Ortiz, who might be you know who just signed with UFC. You got Ken Shamrock who might be somebody, you know, who could fight. You got Tank Abbott, you know, guys like that, guys, the veteran guys who they feed to Lesnar, to, to Bobby Lashley right now, the guys who have name value, who give recognition, and five or six fights down the road, he'll get it. they just wanted to put Bobby Lashley in the, in the ultimate fighter with this group of guys to give, him a chance, to give him a chance to see how good he was. But the chance you take in this is great because you have a great deal to lose. Now, Vito, I, I, I do have a question, though. It's funny because we, we get all these pieces from uh, MMA on ESPN 360, and they talk about how, 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 you know, they talk about we're going from the fake world of professional wrestling to the real world of MMA. But it's funny because once MMA gets a wrestling star, they push them to the moon. So I, do you think it's kind of hypocritical that they're taking a lot of these stars, like Lashley, like Lesnar, and really want to make something out of them because they know that they're going to draw a portion of the wrestle, wrestling audience? No, you see, here's the thing. When people say it's it's fake and it's phony, oh, yeah, there are yeah, different yeah. Style, there's different styles of wrestling. When you fight in the States, you're fighting for the TV. But did anybody ever go to Japan and fight one of those Japanese guys? Oh, no, those guys are legit. They yeah, kick no, you. They, they grow up with judo. Right, they know what That's what I'm saying, is. fellas. Yep. You talk about no, we, you don't need to convince us. And, We're completely on board with you here. I'll just give it to the people who are listening. That sure. In, in, in Japan... That's a different style of wrestling. You better know your stuff or it's going to be a long tour because they're all going to take their toll on you. In Puerto Rico, it's another different style of wrestling. In Santa Domingo, it's another different style of wrestling. When USWA was around, yep. that's a different style of wrestling, Memphis wrestling. Yep. But, you know, you have all different, all different types, all different styles. When you go to each territory and you fight in each different bracket, you have to adapt to each style. Mexican Mexican wrestling is lucha libre, you know what I mean? And when you fight Mexican, you know, you wouldn't think any of those guys could do anything. They do a bunch of high spots, you know what I mean? They roll, they do everything, everything looks pretty, you know what I mean? But when you go to Japan, you better know you, so you better be tough. Sure. Especially yeah. back in the days, if anybody ever watched the Stan Hansen matches or got in there. I, was, I, was, I got in there with Steve Williams, Gary Albright, Tenru. I was the only guy who pinned Mizawa. In 1998, when he was a triple crown winner. Yeah. Yep. And, that was by, and that was by, like, one of those things where Big Vito was just Big Vito. The guy was laughing at me. I said, who the hell is this guy with the green trunks? Man, I'm going to kick his face in. Man, he's laughing at me. I, I was getting so mad in that battle royal. As soon as I, I went in the middle, I was begging for him to come forward because I was just going to pounce on him. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I, I hit him. I nailed him. I punched him. I kicked him. I gave him a stun. I covered him one, two, three. People went crazy. I wrestled in the main event against uh, against uh, Kabashi and Omari and a couple other guys, and I went toe to toe with Kabashi, and I got and we, we we left off even, you know. And I got the nod from across the ring. Steve Williams was standing there. Don't you back down? Don't you back down? Because it's the Japanese against the Americans. And when after that night was over, boss came over and said, "Vito, you had a hell of a first night." He said, "You're in the main event with Steve Williams and Gary Albright." And you go and pin our Triple Crown winner hasn't been pinned in five years. Way to go. And Mizawa was ranked number one. There you go. God bless his soul. A million, million to one together. shot, Rocky Balboa, right? There you go, Rocky <laughs> Balboa. All right, so I want to take it back to the uh, to the United States World of Wrestling and get your opinion on something that we were just about to talk about on the air when we uh, brought you on the air. And that is Raw is doing a new thing, and I wanted to get your honest opinion of it, where they're bringing in what they're calling guest hosts. 
almost a la Saturday Night Live. And you know, last night they or two nights ago I should say they had uh, Jeremy Pivot, who's an actor, come on and do it. And you know what? He really didn't know what he was doing, and and it and it showed. And do you think that ultimately this is a good thing, or do you think that ultimately this is what's not so good about the wrestling business right now? The only reason they're doing this, guys, is because they need to draw ratings because they're not making any ratings. They brought Shaq Daddy in. Shaq came in. He he blew the house off. Everybody wanted to see Shaq. Yep. Shaq and Big Show. Shaq did his thing. You know, Shaq Diesel. Name guy got the ratings. They got this Pippen guy in. The ratings went back down. The only other guy who's going to draw the ratings is Hulk Hogan. There you go. The man right there. He is the man. And wouldn't you know, a pay-per-view, a WrestleMania match, Hulk Hogan against Shaq, Shaq Diesel. Why not? What, you know, would, you see, would you pay to see it? Uh, I, thought, I think I would. You know Absolutely. what? Absolutely. They, they crossed I paths would. at WCW very briefly in 94. Uh, yeah, but Shaq managed Hogan guys, did that speech. No, that was Rodman, actually. And, and I will, no, no, I will come out, I will come out and see this. Go ahead, I'll come out and say this. I guess Vince Russo doesn't look so stupid right now when, uh, what's his name, was heavyweight champion, and he had David Arquette came in and was a heavyweight champion, and David Arquette was brought in to do ratings. Does Vince Russo look stupid now? Yes, because he, that was a horrible, horrible decision. It ruined any sort of credibility that Bell had left. I, I don't agree so with what, that. Actually. So what kind of credibility does Monday Night Raw have if they have to bring uh, in strangers I, I, to throw their ratings? I agree. I completely agree. I think that's a horrible move too. And I think uh, you're going to draw ra- you're going to draw people in, but what they're going to see is these terrible shows and never want to watch it again. And that's what last the, like two nights ago was. It was this joke of a show. And when Vince Russo was on TV and he was just a writer and he was drawing ratings, did he look stupid back then and now? Not that anybody will bring it up, but does he look smart? You know what? I actually like the idea of doing the David Arquette thing because it was the same concept of what they're doing now. It was going to get them on the Entertainment Tonight shows. It was going to get them in USA Today. It was going to get them mentioned. And now, would I have done it? I don't know. But you know what? You can't knock what the attempt was. It was a desperate attempt to get attention, and to a degree, it worked. To a degree, the it worked, but now WWE didn't work at all. WWE is now using this concept right. and now doing this so this way they could draw ratings and they can take care of business so this way they can make money. So, I mean, if you have a shack and, I mean, Pivot, I really could get, I mean, I really can get, if they bring Vin Diesel in, I think that'll draw. They bring, you know, they brought Mickey Rock in, people look because he was in the wrestler, but if you brought Mickey Rock in without doing the wrestler, fizzle, nothing. If you bring in somebody like, uh, they're going to bring a female in sooner or later, who would they bring in? You know, uh, we mentioned Madonna earlier. Madonna being the GM of Monday Night Raw, you know, that would be, wow. That, that would draw a rating, actually. It would. That but, would draw big time. I mean, they you could bring in. Do they you really think wrestling fans and Madonna fans are going to, are the same? Well, they don't Wouldn't have to you, be. Well, are basketball fans and wrestling fans the same? Some are, some are, and I'm a basketball fan and a wrestling fan. And some of them are music fans, aren't they? Exactly, but that's not, you're yeah, not so, also, so, but, uh, you're, not, you're also like, trying to bring a new audience to your wrestling audience. You're not just trying to appeal to just wrestling fans, you're trying to bring the entertainment fans in. I, I, I understand have, that concept, these, but if you don't change your formula and you keep putting on the same terrible shows, no one's going to stick with the product after you put the eyeballs on it. Guys, they've had ZZ Top come in. ZZ Top has been out there for 40 years. Now, it's only a handful of people still listen to the hand. It's easy talk. You know what I mean? They came in, they're a name. You know, if you're going to bring the Eagles in, or you're going to bring, you know, uh, a Beals reunion, or you're going to do, you know. That'd be difficult. You know, yeah. who, who knows who you can bring back, you know what I mean? You know, there's a whole bunch of people. What's to say you can't have Burt Reynolds be the GM Monday Night Raw? Yeah, you know what I was thinking. How about Adam Sandler? Considering he always seems to be a big wrestling fan, he uses a lot of wrestlers in his movies. Yeah, that would work. I mean, you know, but along those lines, guys, you're going to bring a name Vin Diesel on Monday Night Raw. That would draw ratings. Yeah, you know, without what, a doubt. But that's the. I, I agree with you, though. I think that that 
if you build towards Hulk Hogan being one of the general managers, I think that will draw a rating because right now people are starved whether they will admit it or not. They love when Hulk Hogan comes out and the if, crowd reaction is online. It's crazy if, and if Hogan, you see, here it is too. It's an ego thing and it's a money thing. Vince doesn't want to pay Hogan the money he wants. Hogan doesn't want to wrestle for less than what he's worth. So it's a negotiation for it. Do both need each other? Absolutely. If Hulk Hogan went to house shows, would the ratings go up? Would the house shows go up? Without a doubt. Would people pay to see Hulk Hogan wrestle again? 100%. No problem. Yes. Absolutely. And and the proof is in the pudding. I mean, one of the most successful pay-per-views we've seen in the last five years was when Hogan came out and wrestled Shawn Michaels. How about when Hogan and The Rock? Hogan and the, That's one of the most amazing matches of all time, actually. Now, if Hogan came back, and just before the pay-per-view, they had needed a mystery opponent for the, who's going to fight Hulk Hogan, out comes on Monday night, The Rock. I challenge you to WrestleMania. There you go. That would definitely blow the roof off any WrestleMania money that they would make. They'd have to pay Hogan. They'd, have, they'd definitely have to pay The Rock. But yeah. the money they would make on it would be phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Here we are in the state of wrestling the way it is and the economy the way it is and everything. And Basically, what is the next logical step for, for Big Vito? I mean, at one point you were talking about opening a, a school in the Tampa area. And, uh, you know, what's your no next step? Right now, just trying to get some kind of so I can survive this economic, you know, you know, you know, purge that we're in. You know, wrestling is kind of like on a, on a downslide. So, I mean, you really have to think about doing some other stuff. You know, and... Uh, you know, wrestling is just not, you know, is not making it right now. And, you know, you can't live on your savings and you can't live on stuff. So, you know, Big Vito did the next, did the next good thing. I went to some, uh, some schools. I went to some security schools. I got my licenses for, you know, uh, weapons and everything, and, uh, bodyguard work and other things. I put, put in for, to be a, uh, a detention center officer. Oh, really? You know, in Miami. Yeah. Right. I'm waiting for security clearance. You know, but I mean, making that kind of money and having a steady paycheck, you know, being that I've wrestled for all these years, you know, and I've done everything that you could possibly do and I live my dream. I'm happy with my career. If it goes a little further, great, but I have to think about the next 20 years of my life. What am I going to do? You know, and I said when I came home from England, I said I have to think about the next 20 years and, you know, I put in for an application with the, with the uh, detention center in Miami. They took me with open arms. They knew who I was. And, you know, they just said, you just have to wait for security clearance, you're hired. I'm going to put you, walk, walk the beat, and do your thing. And being that I'm from the neighborhood and, and you know, standing on projects, I know how to handle myself in some rough times, I'd feel comfortable in that environment. So it wouldn't phase me. And I know I can, you know, you know the game and you know how to play it in, in one of those, in those situations. And, uh, you know, I would be comfortable and I wouldn't have to worry about nothing. Yeah, I've and it'd be just understand. like you guys working regular jobs. You know, I could always, you know, work on the weekends or do my wrestling tours when I have time. But I mean, you know, you have to eat and you have to pay your rent, pay your mortgage, pay your bills, just like everybody else. And you know, I didn't wrestle 19 years ago. I didn't start to be a millionaire. I wrestled because I love to wrestle. And you know, I did okay and I lived my dream and I did everything. You know, so you know, my goals and what our goals of other people are, you know, two different things. Very cool. So, I mean, if I can say so, I think I insulted your last interview by saying that you weren't the hugest star, but I want to say that you did more than okay. You did damn well for yourself, so you should be very proud of what you accomplished. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You know, it's, uh, it's nice to hear that people watch my career, people watch me wrestle, watch me grow in the wrestling business, and you know, when I get when I go around and I see the guys who help break me in and. You know, and they're, they're wrestling and they're hanging on and they see me and they see what I've accomplished. It makes them proud because I listen to what they have to say and all the things they taught me, I put to good use. Whether I was cocky, I was a badass or whatever, that's what got me out of my neighborhood and that's what made me who I am today. And, you know, maybe I might change a few things, but I wouldn't change everything. And the one thing I wouldn't change is my attitude to be the best because I know I can rock and roll with anybody out there in wrestling. Tremendous, tremendous. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll let you go for the night, but we can't thank you enough for stopping by, Vito. It's always what great to... What happened to all the phone calls? Vito, uh, Patrick, where are you at? Did you get any, did you get all, any of those, or were they all, um, 
non-registered. Oh, all of them were us. Oh, well, there was non-registered ones I saw pop up, but the thing is, Vito, we take a couple of these calls and we get these stupid questions. So what I did was uh, we had to make it so they actually From Abul. What's that again? From Abul, from Pakistan. Yeah, we have a couple of people who like to prank us from uh, claiming to be Abdul from Pakistan, and they tend to call from them different Istanbul. Is What's your question for Big Vito? Vito, would you like to eat some ramen with my people? Absolutely. As long as it has a little spaghetti sauce, you shove it down, we're all right. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, man. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll have you on uh, anytime you want to come on. You're always welcome, and we wish you the absolute best of luck with your uh, with your prison guard uh, duties and uh, absolutely anything we could do to help you out in the future. You know, keep in contact. I know that you guys are. Uh, I know that you guys are working on a trip for me. I greatly appreciate your help. I'm all ready to go. All we got to do is sign the contract. NWE tour at the end of September. Possible Germany tour on, on September 19th. Um, you know, Big Vito's is accepting bookings. Go to VitoBookings at Yahoo.com. Or you can get Vito at ShackDaddyV at AOL.com. And, uh, you know, anybody who needs me for anything, I'm always available. If you need to do some charity work, you just dial Big Vito. We'll get in touch with the people of this radio station. I know they have a website, yep. and I'm sure they'll tell, tell it to you. Anybody who needs Big Vito, go through these guys, and they'll hook you up, and we can always work with you, make everything fast. Everybody can, you know, everybody can be happy, and everybody can make a little money, and uh, everybody can get to enjoy the Staten Island Express Big Vito. Absolutely. Check it out. It's WrestleBookings.com as well as WrestlingEpicenter.com, and all you got to do is send an email, and we will be in contact and see if we can set something up. And uh, we have a great roster on there, and one of the guys that has, um, you know, uh, the most non ridiculous price and then the most hard working guys for the money is Vito and we hope we can get you some stuff out there and we really appreciate you spending this much time with us this evening not a problem fellas I greatly appreciate you having me on it's always a pleasure to talk to you guys I love talking wrestling and you guys made my night by having me and I appreciate the compliment you said my career was meant, meant something and it's nice to hear and I well you know I, I got the feeling last time around that I insulted you but I never meant to because as I said I, I was a fan for, for years I remember when you were in WWF and the in the mid '90s, I remember when uh, you know that match with Sid kind of opened my eyes, saying, "Holy crap, this guy is uh, willing to take what it takes to to make it." So it was really great to see you make it all the way from from where you were, all the way to the WCW Hardcore Title and to the Tag Team Titles. And you know what, you you worked your ass off to make it, man, and we appreciate hard work. I appreciate everything, everything to get your ass kicked, just to wear a dress. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? All right, man. Well, I'll tell you what, Patrick, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Could you click the commercial? And we will be back in just a few moments here on the interactive interview at WrestlingEpicenter.com and Blog Talk Radio. All right, Vito, are you still there? James, you got me. All right. Everybody okay, still on James the line. B. Yeah. Is, there, is everybody here? Everybody in here and that was a great interview man what did you guys think I don't like the anti-terror sentiment hello 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 Hello? is everybody there yeah I'm here is James here oh god I think we lost everybody the switchboard just cut out okay everybody's there and Nick I can hear Nick what did you do, Patrick? I didn't do anything. My computer just fucked up on me. All right. Well, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay. You want me to? You want me to go ahead while the uh, while you get everybody connected? I'll just uh, take start it. I off. think everybody is connected. Because for some reason, it's not playing the commercial. Okay. Well, um, I, I can only hear you, but uh, I'll start off. Um, why, why, why don't we get? Why don't we get to the lovely episode of Monday Night Raw we had the other day? And it's funny because Vito mentioned, like, you have Rock and Hogan, and it's, it's going to mean humongo virus. This is not a matter of putting two wrestlers in a match. This is a matter of reformulating what is a horrible formula that I don't think anyone listening, I don't think anyone that, that watched that show enjoys. It is an absolutely horrendous formula that they have going. I don't care if they have the President of the United States on or the most famous person in the world, whoever he is, and they draw a million, billion, 
a ridiculous number of people. The shows are so bad that every one of those people will hate professional wrestling after they see them. And it is just an abomination that, that these shows have uh, have gone on. And this was kind of the exclamation point on it. it sorry, my, my, I'm getting a little feedback here. Is everybody else here? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, um, I mean, Nick, go. I mean, hit me with some thoughts, my man. What? My God. I mean, are they trying to do the absolute worst show ever? I mean... Especially with this, I don't know, this idiot, Dr. Ken. I have no idea who he was. I know someone's going to yell at me he was in some movie. I don't care. He's basically yeah. been in every rated R comedy in the last five years. He always has, like, a bit part, it seems. He's in, the, he's in Knocked Up as the Doctor. He's uh, in the Hangover as, I, I thought it was one of the, I, I didn't think he was very funny in the Hangover. Um, I like him in Knocked Up. He's in some fake com- uh, some fake trailer for funny people for one of uh, Adam Sandler characters' uh, fake movies that have come out. And he's funny in that, but he was horrendous. I mean, it's like, and you know, and, and I understand that there's like, and Andres and I were I think talking about this, and it's, it's you know different types of actors. I mean, there's 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 stage actors who, and, and wrestlers who are comfortable in front of a live crowd, and they're comfortable also uh, you know in in front of a TV audience. But there's TV and stage a- and TV and movie actors who might not be comfortable in front of a crowd. They seem so uncomfortable. And, I mean, I guess barking like a dog and, and acting like, like, like an Asian slash black pimp uh, passes for entertainment in Ken Jong's mind. I don't know why they called him Dr. Ken. Yeah, I heard he's a doctor, but I've only ever heard him called uh, Ken Jong throughout his entire career, and they magically called him Dr. Ken like everyone knew who he was. And it was horrendous. And the worst part was Jerry Lawler was like, this is great. And then it was funny because at the end of the show, they punctuated it with, what a night. And I'm like, what a night indeed. Can I go? I got to rant. I got to go on this. Okay. The Miz. If anyone now deserves a big push on SmackDown, it's The Miz. Because time and again, despite the fact that he keep his heat against God knows God awful John Cena. I agree. Yes, they gave the Miz. He could have finally done it. The Miz finally could have stolen a win. It was so perfect. But no, no, no. In order to keep Mr. Cena, Mr. Mr. Oh, he's the biggest superstar ever. He's bigger than Hogan. He's bigger than Austin. He's bigger than Ric Flair. He's bigger than Lou says. He's better than Bruno San Martino. And try to convince people once again that John Cena means something. But he's been nothing but a shit, goddamn horrible champion for yeah. what six years now. They once yeah. again had to be. I mean, John Cena. Beat basically seven other men all night. Yeah. How stupid is it that the mitt is perfect? You could have literally killed John Cena last night and had every lumberjack sit on Cena to let the Miz win, and Cena still would have kicked that too. Yeah, it, it, you know, it, it was, <laughs> have we really been doing it with Cena for five years? Yes. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, yeah, five years. And I am sick. I am sick and tired of apologizing for the Miz because there's no fucking reason to do it. He is a dynamo on the microphone. He is a heat machine. And James and I got in a little conversation the other day where he was talking, where, where I compared, well, I was like, you know, uh, James felt he wasn't going to draw money because he doesn't have good in-ring skills. Andre said the same thing about his in-ring skills. I'm sick of arguing with these two guys. I'm sick of arguing with anyone else. What the fuck is wrong with his in-ring skills? Does he botch moves? Does he not work the crowd? Somebody give me a motherfucking empirical example of something he does in the ring that is wrong. Because nobody's done it yet. It's just been an accepted fact that he's bad, and I fucking have had it. The fact is, he has been so hot on that microphone. He is, he's got a great uh, look as far as, you know, I mean, I know he's not the biggest guy, but as far as his, his faux hawk, he just looks like such a that you want to beat down. He's a great heel. The segment where he shot Hornswoggle with the t-shirt gun was an incredible heat getter. It was awesome. And the fact is, this guy reminds me, as far as on the mic and his heat getting abilities, of Jericho in 98. And, and Nick is exactly right. They are squashing guys that could be stars to appease John Cena and to convince us that John Cena is the best. Not going to work. He's not Austin, he's not Hogan, he's not Rock, he's not San Martino, he's not Gorgeous George, he's not Flair, he's not Michael, he's not good. That's the bottom line, and hopefully the, the, po- the possibility of uh, Miz getting a huge push on ECW or SmackDown now seems likely, because Miz deserves better than this crap. Miz carried John Cena to one of his better matches in the past few weeks, uh, when the one he actually got offense, and, and the fact is Cena still sucks, and that match was a joke. Nick, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry we had to have two rants in a row, but that's how I feel. 
All right, let me, oh, uh, let me jump in here. Let me jump in here because I was on the phone with Vito, and Vito really was appreciative of the uh, interview, guys. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it, too. That was really good. Um, let me give you my take on this. And I'm not a big Miz fan. Actually, I think he's pretty mediocre. Um, How? Well, yeah, what? If, if you're over to Cena, point something, point, yeah, point something out. Point something out, uh, James. And, and if Andres is here, I'd say the damn same thing because you and him say the exact same thing. Point something out that he does that is wrong. There's nothing that he it? does that is wrong with. There's nothing that that he does that's all that right either. Stop it! That, 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 that's an escapist thing. Does does, or does his kick look bad? Is, is he bad on the mat? Does he not work the crowd? What is it? Tell me. I want to hear it. You get a feeling from people when you watch them, when you know that they're a star, and when you know that they're not a star. And this guy is not a star. He doesn't Maybe have. Maybe he gets it. squashed every four seconds. Maybe he gets what again? Maybe he gets squashed every four seconds by John Cena. So you're conditioned to think he's a loser. And by all rights, you should think he's a loser. He never beats anyone. But you say that. You say that I should be conditioned to think that he's a loser. But I don't, you know, I'm not as easily trained as the average bear. Um, I'm, I'm not like a dog that, that you know, you, you teach. I, I, I agree. I agree. But, but, also, but, the but also, even if, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll let you, I'll let you continue with your point in a second. I don't mean, I don't mean to interrupt. But I, I do want to say this. When somebody is pushed correctly and the crowd reacts with a real fervor, that's infectious. No matter no matter how much you know, you will get, you can get caught up in the moment. And the fact is, uh, there's crowd reaction for the Miz because he is good, but there's also a lack of crowd reaction because no one believes him to be credible, and that translates. But I mean, go ahead, go ahead with your point. Yeah, but by that standard, but by, by your standard of saying that the guys that get the wins over talent are the ones that shine better, then holy shit, Hornswoggle is a huge star right now, isn't he? Because as far as uh, well, I can tell, he's undefeated. There, sure, well, yeah, he's. I mean, he's he's getting huge reactions uh, because he beats the kids. Earth, but he's not. I mean, he's beating. He's beating. He's beating jobbers. But he is. Yeah, he is getting massively over for whatever reason. I'm not defending oh, that. I think that you should do that. But that's that's what it is. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, I, Miz is saying things we're all thinking when he says, "I can't see you because your movies aren't in theaters long enough." That's true. Seen as a failure as a movie star, and Miz said it. And that kind of honesty is refreshing. Cena makes Hogan look like look like fucking Lawrence Olivier. Cena is so fucking horrible, and wow. his movies draw no 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 money. You see, twelve rounds. No, of course you did. It was the number one DVD in the lowest ranked sales of DVD weeks of of in like the past five years. And WWE triumphed it like it was some big. Big thing, and then guess what? The next week, it slipped off like the top twenty. Yes, he, he nobody buys his stuff, and, and Vince is like going to lose money to prove to us that he's a star. I'm sick of it. <laughs> sick of it. I'm pretty sure Patrick's sick of it. I mean, I, I oh, I got sick of Cena years ago. Now yeah, it's just yeah. hilarious. Yeah, but you say that, but the reason why I turned on him initially is because I hated the rap gimmick. But oh, now he's not geez, doing the rap geez. gimmick. Oh, well, we are far now. beyond that. There. Yeah, we're we're. I mean, geez, the generic military gimmick. I mean, Nick, back me up here. I mean, Dan, the guy has done nothing remotely what they try to promote him as. Every year he bombs at WrestleMania. Every major feud they try to push him into, you, you wind up cheering for the heel. Kurt Angle came out and basically said, I hope to God that we lose in Iraq. And guess what? People pop for Kurt Angle like he had just saved a baby out of a burning inferno. Yeah. And here's the thing. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. James, you know how I feel about Hulk Hogan, but I will name about ten Hulk Hogan matches that I can watch again and again because Hogan has a natural charisma. Whether I like him or not, whether I think he's a joke as a worker, he has an aspect of him that is compelling to a degree. This is Which not the Miz like... does not have. No, no, we're not talking... no the, the, the Miz has it. Cena doesn't have it. What we're talking about now is Cena. The fact is, Cena does not have this. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to ask. I mean, obviously James feels this way. Patrick, Nick, do you feel the Miz could be a star if actually promoted correctly? Both of you. Honestly, my honest opinion of the Miz uh, in the ring, I think he's decent. Uh, he doesn't really blow my mind. But as especially during the feud with Cena and the initial build up, I was like, holy shit! I think they got something with this guy because he actually got me to care about a John Cena match, which I don't think I've cared about a John Cena match in about four or five years. And yeah. there's got to be something there if he was able to do that. Exactly. Here's the thing. The most interesting thing, even remotely related to John Cena recently, 
has been the little few with the Miz, and that's because the Miz got to do it alone at first. He didn't have to deal with John Cena coming out and doing his stupid joke. I mean, Miz is the one that gave me any reason to care about that feud. Miz is the only reason I was watching. Miz is also the only one who cut promos, though. Yeah, no, John Cena comes the only one that probably You probably just thought you were watching the game show network because he sounds like an amalgamated version of Jim Carrey every time he speaks. Hey, everybody, it's me, John Cena. Oh, no, I'm going to get serious and talk about how I'm going to beat you up. Oh, jeez, what a 2D character. He's an idiot, and he's so uncomfortable up there. Yeah, he can... He can speak just fine like a public speaker, but he is just so full of bullshit, and that's why nobody above the age of four likes him. <laughs> I think what to do with the way that WWE books him. I think with John Cena, it's a situation of, well, am I really going to say no to this? Because, hey, he's getting the title. He's winning matches. To me, I, I agree. The, it, yeah. He was actually pretty good. I know Jane's going to say, hey, the rap gimmick, but the rap gimmick was somewhat compelling because yes. it would happen. He would he would jog. He would lose matches. He would, then he would fight back. He would win. That was interesting. When he was U.S. champion and he was and he was actually kind of a fair and balanced guy, he did well. But ever since they decided he's got to be the superstar, and they made him into freaking Superman. There's nothing compelling about John Cena because I know he's going to win. I mean, he got. I said this before. He got thrown through a spotlight and electrocuted, and the next night he came out stumbling. That's the match. He was not stumbling. Him. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, you can't, you cannot, okay, in any movie that anybody watches, if the protagonist does not face some sort of adversity, you are not going to get emotionally invested. And it's funny, because Vince is always like, we make movies. Yeah, you make horrible movies. But as far as your wrestling, uh, you don't have a protagonist that's actually believable, because you don't let him actually get hurt. The game, oh, he, drew, oh, he, he, by a smidgen, he lost a handicap match to these guys. Wow, Ted, Cody, you guys are slightly better than Triple H when you're together. That's wonderful. Great way to promote you guys. And Cena, wow, no one can beat him. In fact, Cena and Orton beat 40,000 guys last year in that match. And it's just, it is mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling, that this is man, I, like, <laughs> that thinks that this is going to get over. Well, look, no. you can't expect fair and balanced in, in wrestlers because they're not the Fox News Network. But you got to look at wrestling the way that it is, and yes, you're right. But the also you get money. What's that? A business meant to draw money. A business meant to draw money. Okay. That is it. John Cena does not make does not draw. Yes, what it, you can't you can say oh it's not fair and balanced. Here's the thing: John Cena has done nothing to live up to the huge push he has been given. It's more than to pass time to say just throw in the towel and say okay this isn't going to be our guy and start looking for somebody else. Yeah, I mean, you get the say you get the same rating. I mean, you get the same three point five, and you get that you get without him. Do you Pretty think much. so? Though? I mean, and I'll be honest. Well, no way. I'll be honest here. Uh, from my personal perspective, I stopped watching the WWE regular regularly in two thousand seven when he was the champion for a year. No, no, I just no, got no, we, we have a historical. Uh, we have a historical confirmation here of Cena being the anti-draw and actually forcing Patrick not to watch. So, uh, based on based on my study that I've done right now, Cena has <laughs> negative one fans, and we haven't seen anyone who said that they watched because of Cena. So right now, that's my that's my scientific thing I'm going yes, on. Yes, but that's just it's judging true. on the four people that are on the phone right I, now. I know, not, James, it was a joke. I know, but I'm saying, there are kids that you cannot deny the drawing power of, of the guy because his t-shirts sell. You always see the shirts on little kids in the crowd. You know, we could sit here and be cynical about that and say, Oh, but those are little kids. They don't know better. You know what? But you know what? Guess what? Those guys are going to be the ones in 20 years that are going to be doing this kind of show. Yeah, and you know what? They're going to be smarter by them. And by the time they get to age 10, they're like, oh, wait, this guy isn't very, very good. Let's not watch this anymore. And then kids will cheer for heroes. They can see anybody in that role. If they yeah, were, exactly. If they were, I, I disagree with Okay, go ahead. Same way, you're going to see a bunch of little kids, kids dressed up like CM Punk. I mean, Hogan, they were talking about Hogan. He appealed to adults. He appealed to children. Austin, Austin appealed to adults, and that was at a time where they were really chasing the adult dollar thing. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I, was, I was in sixth grade when Austin came out. There were kids into him, too, so that's not really a fair argument. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it, I mean, Cena only gets kids. And, yes, you may think, oh, well, kids. Oh well, you know, yeah, in twenty years gonna grow up. I got just as many kids that watched wrestling when they were little. This is adults today that watched wrestling when they were little, like, 
Yeah, I don't watch it anymore. And yeah, I, that's, I, most I, of our, that's most of our generation. Everybody I talk to say, oh, yeah, I don't watch it anymore. It, it hasn't been good since they bought WCW. I'm like, you're correct, sir. Yeah, that's that's about right, yeah, because I'm on Facebook now, and I, every once in a while I get a message from somebody on Facebook, holy shit, I remember when you were such a big wrestling fan. I'm like, what do you do now? I'm like, uh, run a wrestling business. <laughs> and they say, you still watch that crap? And it's like, well, I don't mention watch it, but I also, you know, am involved in trying to get these guys bookings and, you know, store, and a radio show and all this. And they're like, Why? It sucked since 2001. And, and, and James, if you, if you had talked to somebody, an intelligent, respected person with a job and all sorts of things, and you said, hello, sir, I'd like to invite you over to my house this Monday so you can partake in Monday Night Raw. And, sorry, there's a drink, I might be a little loud. And, and, they, said, and they said, certainly, James, I'd love to watch this show with you. And then, and then you guys saw the show, they would think you were an idiot. They would if I if many of my friends that don't watch wrestling saw me watch that show on Monday, they would say, Eric Clancy, you are a fucking moron. And you know what? I would have said, you're absolutely right. I don't know why I watch that piece of garbage. But that was one of the most embarrassing things. If anyone if they're I would I would suggest not putting on celebrities because their shows are so bad, I, I want them to be hidden from other people so they don't know how horrible wrestling is right now. At first Oh long. yes. Who was that little chinky dude? Was that was that like Sonny Ono? What was that? What? We went over that while you we went over that while you were in the while you were on the phone with Vito. Okay, now that was horrible. Now you were talking about Miz a few minutes ago, and, and we'll go back to that and we'll we'll finish up with that. By the way, guys, but, if my phone goes out, so I'm losing power, so I'm just I'm just letting you know. Okay, okay. Tell the truth though. I think if Miz was ever going to turn babyface, all he had to do was clock the Asian dude, and he would have been the oh, biggest yeah. babyface of the night. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we um we were talking about that. Um, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, we were talking about that in, in, in reference to, uh, his name is Ken Jong, and, uh, he's actually a knocked up. He's funny in that. I didn't think he was very funny in The Hangover, but he's in a lot of the, the Judd Apatow comedies. But yeah, we all agree that he was absolutely an abomination. Um, and the, the, and we, 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 I mean, we, we had a long segment of talking about that, but I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was horrendous. It was absolutely horrendous, but the best part, the best part is at the end of the show, Jerry Lawler said, well, when they turned heel and, and, and he and Dr. Ken, as they called him, even though I've never heard them call him Dr. Ken before, um, they said, Lawler said he, he was going, oh, we're from Hollywood, shut up. You know, like, basically, I think it was supposed to be like a parody of, like, the heel, like, the stereotypical, like, heel mannerisms that people do, although it was horribly executed. But Jerry Lawler says, well, you gotta wonder what happened to Dr. Ken. He's been so hilarious all night, and now he's making fun of our fans and hurting John Cena. He was doing the exact same thing, King. He was doing the exact same thing he was doing before, but except now it was directed at the fans and John Cena. So not only is King an idiot for thinking the original act was funny in the first place, but he's an even bigger idiot for not liking the act once it's directed at someone else. And it was just like, what a stupid character. Yeah, and King is picking up a new habit that is pissing me off, too. He would take a stupid line that wasn't funny at all that this guy would say, and then repeat it and snicker. Yeah. And it's just, oh my God! Can you, uh, can you? By the way, I, I completely agree with you. I can't remember a specific line. Do you remember any of those? Because I just want to repeat those to my, like, I just want to laugh myself to sleep tonight. I, I cannot. I think remember. the bulldog line against Michael Cole. Wasn't that one of them? What was that? Where, where uh, Michael Cole? No, no, no. We're, we're talking about the bulldog. The kid, the kid that Doctor Ken said. Oh well, I don't, I don't know. I didn't see it. Well, I, I can't remember any of those lines, but it was pretty bad. He did it at least three times in the opening segment. Yeah, he loved it. King loved it. King's an idiot. I don't think King did love it. I think King just is paid to pretend that he loves it. If so, he's a... Is that why he smiles like an idiot? Yeah. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick called me the other day and he said, Eric, you were completely right. I turned it on. They had the stupid, smiling pumpkin faces. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. You know, it was pretty bad. But that's what they're paid to do. I mean, they, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel sorry for them. If yeah, they you know, really were going to sit there, if they said, you know, what if they saw a match between Kelly Kelly and uh, Gail Kim or something, and it was a freaking horrible match? What if they went on the air and said, well, that sucked. Why do we employ these people? Jesus Christ. I, I, I agree, but at the same time, go back to look at some stuff in 97. JR would make fun of no holds barred and all sorts of stuff, and they they would make fun. Of, they would be honest about the product. I'm not saying they trash their own product, but there was a sense of honesty there. And you're like, 
obviously you're going to still try to sell your product, but if you're going to be a, if you're going to meet me halfway here, I'll respect that, you know. I remember when uh, Jackie Gata fell flat on her face and had that terrible match with Trish on Raw, which was like the worst match ever. I think even yeah. Jr. made fun of it after a while. Yeah, Jr. Jr. had a code word. It was called "bowling shoe ugly," and he would say it a lot. Yeah. Well, and, and you got to give as bad as Lawler has been of late. You got to give Jr. credit, and I'm going to go spin this positive. Oh, I, love, I love Jr. He's doing a hell of a job on SmackDown with Morrison. I think he's I excited think. again. I, I think he's not. legitimately excited about Morrison. James, a half an hour of actually doing your job correctly does not make up for 90 minutes of sounding like you're asleep and looking for a shotgun. That's how bad Jr. is now. Yes, he's excited about John Morrison. Woo hoo! He's excited about the one guy pretty much everyone's excited about. He is not, he, that does not make up for his bad announcing the rest of the time. I mean, it'd be, it'd be like, you know, well, it, it'd be like if you had somebody, just, if, if I only posted on the news line one story a day that was done, that was done correctly, and every, every other story I posted on the news line was, you know, I would intentionally mistype words, and, and I'd, I'd put weird spacing in there, and I'd make it all look very unlegible and very un, un, unenjoyable to read. Right, right, right. Because I was excited about saying like TNA science deal with ESPN will have you know weekly television show. That would not you would not get me a compliment for getting one story right. That's why I can't give Jr. the one compliment because yes, he gets to about John Morrison. That, that's it. Who isn't excited about John Morrison? The problem is Jr.'s job is to try and make us interested in the other segments, and he really doesn't even sound that the way. Even sometimes when Punk's out there, I think he just kind of drifts through. It's like. Yeah, I know. If you're not here to be world champion, you shouldn't be here. Then a week later, yeah, if you're not here to be world champion, you shouldn't be here. On and on. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, what can you do, though? I mean, unfortunately, we're not living in the in the age of the colorful characters that we had when, when J.R. was at his best. And I'm not just talking about the Attitude Era. I'm also talking about 1990 WCW, because at that stage, you had guys that went on to be the next huge superstars. And that's who J.R. called in WCW that, remember, that everybody remembers as being a huge uh, influence on. You know, he, he called Flair Steamboat. He called uh, Sting Flair. He called a lot of these guys, a lot of these great matches. And quite honestly, you know, I, I've been watching some old uh, UWF Mid-South uh, footage, which J.R. called as well. And he was just red hot on his game. I mean... Right. And- that's that also 25 years ago. Right, that was I, but I, I don't think he's that bad right now, though. Yeah, but he was younger. He was hungrier. Today, I just kind of feel like he feels like he's, to a certain extent, safe. Because every time they try to get rid of him, they they choose to pick the coach to put up there, or they just thought, or they bring Joey Styles in, and then even Joey Styles actually does a good job. It's just like, no, someone cannot call the move. So he brings Jr. back. So I think yeah, what was the deal with that? No, I like I like um, Joey Styles, but they got on his back for actually calling the moves. And they well, like wrestling. Huh. It's not a wrestling fan. He hates actually. I think if Vince could somehow, he would do a show with nothing but backstage segments and interviews. He, I don't think this man is really a fan of the in-ring product of professional wrestling. I think he enjoys more of the storylines, the angles, and I think he he would rather have that be the focus of his show. Now, yes, that sometimes can be a good idea. I think you've got to push a storyline, especially if you want to get over, especially if you're, say, trying to push CM Punk's heel turn, for example. But you have to also then call the moves because if not, people aren't going to know exactly what's going on and why the hell they're holding in that strange position for five minutes. Well, exactly. Well, that gives yeah. to the sport aspect of it. Like, if I'm watching an MMA fight, I expect to have the moves called. If I'm watching a football game, I expect to have the plays called. It's well, you'd have to if you're watching MMA because you've got two guys rolling around in the missionary position, which you're going to end up with in your with your wife in five minutes. Hey, well, what it, the hell is it, the deal with that? Can you hear that? me right now, by the way? Yes. Can you hear you? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I want I – want, and sorry, I'm, I had to charge my phone, so I'm in a different position. But uh, – and if you guys can't hear me, just, just let me know. Um, we are in – this is not a real wrestling match. We're all aware. But we are in the context within the context of the story, it is. It's like a comic book. Spider-Man's not really fighting the Green Goblin. It's, it's, it's on a paper. But we want to be brought into the, into the, 
into the world of the comic book and believe this is a real fight going on. So to do that, we need to color that as though we're at a real sporting event. What do announcers do? They call moves. They detail strategies. They talk about certain things. That's what they should be doing. Right. Or like any given uh, the movie on any given Sunday, when they Great would call, when it a little brief snippets of the announcer calling the actual game, the announcer was not was not talking about things that the announcer should have. The announcer was not pushing the, the plot of the movie. He was actually talking about, oh yeah, the game and the score, and oh yeah, the Sharks need this to get into the playoffs. Well, yes. that's and that's what I'm trying to say with the last week's show. They should have done a tournament because then they would have had programming that writes itself in terms of matches leading into SummerSlam and guys actually having a parity over the other guy. And one guy would have defeated the other guy, which in, in turn means that he defeated him, therefore he goes on to the next round. Instead, we got you know Jack Swagger lost last week, which he shouldn't have lost, and this week he essentially squashes Evan Bourne. Well, and doesn't then, really do anything for anybody then, does it? Yeah, and then immediately they bring out MVP, which I'm not saying... Swagger versus MVP couldn't be a, a good match. What I'm saying is, okay, they had Swagger lose the week before, and now Bourne gets squashed. Now it seems like instead of continuing the feud with Bourne, where you can say, okay, these guys are one-for-one one against each other, they're going back to the MVP feud, which just made no sense to me. I don't know. Yeah, we're all, all right. the best. I mean, what can you say? And we kind of touched on this with Vito, but the guest host thing uh... – I don't know. For me to just bring in a celebrity guest just to spike the ratings up, maybe well, like Shaq. I, 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 I mean, go ahead, Patrick. No, I'm just saying. It, it, to me, that's just a quick fix solution that's only going to work for one week. It's just it, exactly, exactly. And Vito made the point like, put Rock and Hogan at WrestleMania. That's great. Rock and Hogan isn't going to fix the horrible skits and the horrible booking that's going on. This is not a problem of putting two wrestlers who draw next to each other. As I said earlier, this is a formulaic problem. This needs to start an overhaul at the top. Vince McMahon needs to realize that he's getting 3.6s with celebrities, which are the same 3.6s he's getting without the celebrities, and realize that it's not doing a damn bit of good. Well, the thing is, wrestling fans right now, the ones that are tuning in and watching Raw, are going to watch it no matter what they put on. So why not slow it down? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and I was ex- trying to explain to them, what changed in wrestling? And they actually asked me this again, going back to Facebook. They said, what changed? And I said, well, it used to be good. It's not good anymore. I mean, that's as simple as I tell you what changed. We lost WCW and ECW and Vince got lazy. They, well, um, James, they don't, it's like when you, a lot of people see a movie that maybe don't know a lot about filmmaking or know, they, they may not know why they don't like it, but they don't like it. They, they, these people may not be able to articulate the reasons but they know they don't like it, and it's not good. They're correct. They just don't know why they don't like it, and there's a well, lot of reasons. I'll explain that. I'll every... explain why, though. People like to want things. It's the basis of the economy. We want to buy a new car. We want to go buy a new CD. We want to go buy a new DVD. We want to buy the new plasma TV, which looks exactly the same as my glass TV. We want to do these things because it's what people want. It's people wanting something which drives people to go spend money. Now, the problem that I see is exactly what you guys are saying. It's a formulaic problem. But the problem starts and finishes with the programming. And the programming right now is giving us everything for free on Raw, but the problem is we don't even want it anymore. We're getting the main events for free on Raw. Hello? Hello? Hello. Did, did we, we lose, lose James? James? We, lo- we lost James. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> you said that like we we like oh my god we lost we lost James. Yeah, we we totally did. He's called out. We, we, uh, we'll we wait him to call back. No, Nick. Nick left us. Okay. Well, work. I'm 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 about to take my phone off the charger. Start talking, and I will come in in four seconds. Okay. Well. Our little rant from James Walsh is, will be concluded when he comes back on, but I, I will say that I agree with James totally in the, the state of Raw right now. It's just, you know, I, I remember a few weeks ago when they did the Cena Triple H match, and they were trying to hype it up like it was the biggest match in Raw history, and you're a fool if you miss it, and stuff like that. And I really don't didn't care. I didn't want to see it. I 
I had no interest in that match at all whatsoever, and I had no interest when it was when when I actually saw it or whatever. And James, are you back on the line? I, I am indeed back on the line. Sorry about that. I heard a loud snapping sound. I guess Triple H was somewhere outside my house and, and clipped my phone wire. Oh, so that wasn't me that did that. Maybe not. He, I think maybe he hit it with a sledgehammer. Oh, okay. I'll show him. No one talks bad about me. Well, I'm not actually talking bad about it, but the thing is, here, and let me finish my rant here. It also drives us to do things. Um, in my honest opinion, nothing would ever have been created by man if it wasn't for the intent of wanting a woman. <laughs> and which, which also explains why airplanes and missiles and all that are shaped like penises. Uh, because men want women. That's, that's the drive of civilization. Men want something. Women want things, too. People inherently want things. And when we watch Raw, we're not left with a desire to want something because we've seen it already. I, I think, uh, I, I think you're, you're exactly right. And I, 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 I think I finally have articulated something that we've all talked about. We all talked about how Eric Bischoff, ru- you know, ruined the, uh, the uh, well, sorry, there's a siren in the background. Eric Bischoff ruined wrestling by giving away marquee matches on, on TV. You know why those marquee matches? Why there were marquee matches? It wasn't the talent. We'd seen Hogan before. We'd seen Luger before. We'd seen Macho before. What was it about it? Hmm. He promoted those matches three weeks ahead of time. That doesn't happen. I mean, what you do is now, what he would do is he'd promote those matches, then he'd promote even bigger matches on pay-per-view. So, you can put the same guys on, on TV, but if you're not promoting the matches, if it's just Jack Swagger versus MVP on a show, we may say, oh, that's giving away a match for free. Not if maybe you promoted it for four weeks and then it comes on Raw. That's the difference. Bischoff would be promoting different match, match, big matches every week, and he'd switch them off and he rotated what he wanted to do, and that was the difference. It had nothing to do with the talent. It had to do with the writing. It had to do with the promotion of it, and that was the big, that's the big difference of now. There's no promotion. There's no build-up. There's no hype for anything. They just put these characters in, they put them in skits, and they think that's a promotion. That's not promotion. That's not what worked before. It's not what's working right now. And you know what? We can go back all the way to Florida Championship Wrestling, and and everybody wanted to see Dusty Rhodes kill Kevin Sullivan because the devil would do things to these people, and and he'd do this, that, the other thing, and Dusty would cut his weird-ass promos, and I never really got the character, but there you go. I love Dusty. you got to love him, but... You never really got what the hell you're talking queen, about. Taking wheel. Yeah, talking about the devil, if you will. Devil went down to Georgia. Anyway, he would he would sit there and and he cut these promos. Now, at the meantime, Kevin Sullivan would go out and beat the shit out of somebody in the ring and and win a match. And Dusty would go out and have a match with somebody, usually somebody somewhat competitive that maybe had something loosely to do with Sullivan, like maybe uh, the Purple Haze, but. These matches took place, and, and at the end of the day, he never got his hands on Sullivan until it was going to mean something. Now, if he would have got his hands on Kevin Sullivan every single time, would it mean anything when it's supposed to be the big time? No. That is, that's that exactly, what, yeah, that's oh. exactly what killed Orton in Triple H in Mania. Well, it, well there's multiple things behind that. But the well, that was the major the one, though, that... Triple H kicked his ass every week, so nobody sure. goes. Yeah, I, I agree. But but, but James, James's storyline is a perfect is a perfect concept. He's talking about, and this is a great wrestling storyline because what James is talking about is James is talking about a baby face taking on a group of heels with one heel as the leader. Every week he battles one of the heels and he beats them, but he doesn't get the leader. So every one of those match, it's a main event match because he's taking down a portion of that evil, and then still doesn't get the ultimate uh, head of the evil. That's safe for the big event. But each of these matches are main event quality because they mean something in the context of the storyline. Luke isn't killing Vader yet. He's taking out Boba Fett, Jabba the Hutt. He's not going to get Vader till the pay-per-view, and that's what happens. But these matches still mean something, and you don't give them away. That's a perfect example because, like you said, it builds up the want, yet still satisfies the fans that are there in the arena. Exactly. And people still are thinking... Who I want to see him get a hold of him. You know what? If the exactly. girl gives it up on the first date, you're not exactly going to go all out on the second date, are you? Agreed, agreed. And, and the idea, I mean, the idea is you're still, you're not cheating the fans because he is, he is getting the beat on the villain, but you still want to see him beat the bigger villain. And I'm not saying wrestling has to be that simplistic, but that is some of the basic formulas that are there. Obviously, we're going to move past, you know, 
1980s, 1970s booking here, but, but we're not even getting the basics right now. We're not getting intelligent, complex storylines, but we're also not getting good, simple storylines either. SmackDown for a while, and, and even now, even with the horrible title change, was, wasn't the most complex show, but it was good, simple wrestling 101. If, if you're going to do that, I'm not going to complain. You know, maybe I'll complain about a few things, and maybe there will be a challenge as much as I like to, but you know what? It's a lot better than the mess we see on Mondays. I think everything's better than the mess we see on Mondays. Oh, and, and, you know, no. for all the flack ECW and TNA get, it's like, I'll watch those shows a hundred times I watch, before I watch Raw. Yeah, again. I watch Superstars more than I watch Raw, honestly, because, I mean, <laughs> Superstars to me just reminds me of a good old WCW Saturday night, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't remind me of the superstars of the of the you know the eighties and nineties, but it reminds me of Saturday Night. You just see you see some guys like Zack Ryder get in there, who ne- yeah. not necessarily going to get featured on SmackDown or ECW or whatever, but they get a, they get a chance to be on TV and have a really good match and show people, hey, you know I, I'm in, I'm in this company too, and yeah. when and, they and, ever and decide to use me, you'll know my moves. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of these guys, James, you love your squash matches. A lot of these guys. A lot of these matches are squash matches. You'll have Morrison versus Ryder. Morrison's going to beat him. There's no question about that. These, I mean, these are modern-day squash matches. They're good, but they're modern-day squash matches, and, and it gives you an avenue to see that. Exactly. Yeah, well, last week they did Orton versus Primo, which yeah, I that, think that's, that's a match they could do on Raw. Yeah. I mean, that, that, what, what, and, and Orton wins clean. Hmm, what a shocker. Top heel beats the mid-carter. Goes over. Hey, that works. Yeah, Exactly. Um, you know, but, it, but it, it goes through. We, we were talking about want, and here you go. Here's an example, and, and a guy again. I was wrong about, and I'll probably be apologizing this until I'm blue in the face. But Punk, he comes out at the end of SmackDown last week. You know, fists Hardy in the head with a microphone. Cuts a promo after beating the crap out of him, saying, "Next week I get my belt back." Whoa! Look at it this way. We now have a reason to watch next week because I want to see what might happen. I want to see what happens. Exactly. Well, you know, as, as an actor, the first thing they tell you is to go after what you want. It's the same in professional wrestling. All these characters should have a want, and you should establish the want for the audience as well. I think that's a really kind of great, I don't want to say a, 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 the letter for today is want, but I mean, kind of agree, like reading Rainbow <laughs> Sesame Street concept to pound into this. Want, I mean, Al Snow talked about it. You need to make them want it. You need to make them bleed for it. You need to make them want to crawl over broken glass. Then you give it to them, and you make them want something else. Exactly how it was. Let me give you a perfect, perfect example. Stone Cold Steve Austin. You wanted him to win that title. Boom, boom, goes through DX. Boom, boom, beats, beats Michaels. Uh-oh, his boss is trying to ruin him. So now he's got to take out Vince. So, boom, he gets the title. But he's not, you're, it's, not a sad, it's not a happy celebration while the next day. Next day he's got a new villain to go after. So you need to create the next want after that. So, I mean, perfect example. And it doesn't have to go month to month. You don't have to go, okay, this month it's going to be Randy Orton taking on whoever he's going to be taking on, Cena. Yeah. And, and, you know, week one, he must beat Cody Rhodes. Week two, he must yeah. beat Ted DiBiase. Yeah. It doesn't have to go this formula all the time. It could be, oh, I agree. You know, it could be John Cena if Cena's the one going against Orton. John Cena against, I guess he won't be doing it anymore, but The Miz. And you could have uh, Legacy come in and, and, and like try and screw him out of the match without getting disqualifications. You know, pull his leg when he hits the ropes and things behind the referee's back. Do things yeah. like that to really start to steam up the feud. Of course, Miz yeah. is going to lose because that's what the Miz does. But you know, uh, well, yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I think I, I'm not like you said. These are what we're giving here is examples. These aren't hard and fast rules. I don't think any art has a hard and fast rule. It's not a science. It's something that has flexibility to it. I think that's a great part of professional wrestling. I think that's a great part of so many things in entertainment. And I think the, the um, I mean, I think what you should try to do is program an arc like you do on a television show, on a normal television show. You program the television show arc. You program the season arc. You program the series arc. I think Vince should be doing this. He should program. He doesn't do it anymore. I, so people talk about this, but if you want to go back from last year's WrestleMania to this year's WrestleMania, there's no arc no. there. It's just, it's just a random mishmash of matches. You, he should program from WrestleMania to WrestleMania, pay-per-view to pay-per-view, Raw to Raw. So he has a big overarching story that will be satisfying, entertaining, and have, have an, a sense of anticipation on it, too. Well, I mean, and, and everything does it. You know, every major show that's ever been successful does it. It's not yeah. my favorite show, but look at Friends. Who didn't want to see, for the first however many seasons of that series, 
Ross and Rachel get it on. You yeah, wanted to see they get it on together. the first episode? Well, they hey, I never watched the show. I only watched, like, minor episodes that other people would make me see. Everybody wanted to see them get together, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And no, they didn't. As far as I know, they didn't. What's it again? They, 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 no, I, I was just saying I agree with you, yeah. Yes, and, and you know what? They built that out through most of the series, and eventually they did toss, twists and turns where they kind of gave it to you, and then he screws it up, and at the end they end up you know, getting it right. Great. They were doing that. We keep praising, praising – I watch too much Shark Week, and the, the Australians are screwing up my accent. Um, you got – um, you've got Big Bang Theory, for example. Penny now, and Sheldon. Exactly. They're, they're teasing it. Has it has to be with, Penny and Sheldon, damn it. Yeah, they're teasing Penny and Sheldon. Now they teased Penny and Leonard, and that happened, and it kind of wasn't satisfactory, so they kept going. They're teasing these things. It's simple storytelling. It's not well, rocket science. Yeah, I- I- exactly. And obviously, the, 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 real, the real fantastic uh, films and books are the things that, that, I mean, that's the core of it. These are basic things. It's, it's how you dress it up. It's how, how you add your twist. Those are the things you can play around with. But, once again, let's go, let's go to Harry Potter, which James, I know, doesn't like, but Patrick and I do like, but it's a basic story here. Voldemort versus Harry. That's exactly. what it is. And, and God the, damn it, it. How, how long did it take him to actually introduce Voldemort? Exactly. It takes four, four books to introduce Voldemort. So you've milked four books without even getting your villain out of the gate, really. And then he gets there. Then you have your, then you have your next three. Uh, the, the third book, I mean, the final book's just a final battle. That's, that's, that's the Starcade match. That's the WrestleMania match is Harry versus Voldemort in that book. And, yeah, the, and, of course, there's, there's deep relationships, characters, all sorts of things. But at the crux, it's Harry versus Voldemort. That's the story. Vince, what's your story? Tell it to us. Dress it up. What what is your story? And that's, you know, it's that's funny we problem. talk about it's... Cena, as like we talk about Cena and how lame his character is and everything. The WWE seems to screw him over when it comes to making people want to see his matches. And I think the be- best example I could come up with was the feud with Big Show, where he gets slammed through the fucking spotlight and so oh god, I want to see what happens here. And uh, I I assumed he was going to be off TV for a few months and they were going to milk the injury for all it was worth and. He's I thought he was going to back. come back to SummerSlam. Yeah, yeah, I, that's what we were all thinking. And then, no, he shows up the next night and just completely killed the whole thing, just to make Cena look like Superman. Exactly. And, that, and, and, and it, the oh. reason he's been hurting is good. James is talking about he programs month to month. It's just like, this month it's Orton, this month it's Cody, this month it's Triple H. That's what they do. It's just like Cena, and this is the next guy, or Triple H, and this is the next guy, or Orton, and this well, is the next guy. There's no arc to it. i got a couple things to say real quick. Um, you have you, you, we always reference Starcade and how brilliant it was the the lead up, not necessarily the match, but the lead up sure, to Hogan sure. and Sting. And there was twists and turns in that as well, though. Hogan yeah. stopped along the way and feuded with Luger. Hogan stopped along the way and feuded with Piper. You know there was uh, there were stops along the way, but it was clear where it was going. Yeah, exa- ex- exactly, exactly. And and you know if you ever read the Harry Potter books, Harry feuds with Draco, Harry feuds with Snape. Harry has a, like, you think he's feuding with Sirius. There's stops along the way. There is, like, you, you can't, you don't just focus on that, but like you said, you knew where the final destination is, but these obstacles that are taking them off, off the course. I mean, you know, if you have a knight that's going to a castle and the final enemy is the, the wizard and you have another knight, a dragon along the way, you know he needs to get to that princess and beat that, that guy, but there's going to be things along the way to deter him from that. This is, like you said, this is not rocket science. This is basic storytelling. You can get this in any script writing book in the country, guys. It's not expensive. Vince, I'm pretty sure you can afford seventeen ninety nine to learn how to tell a story. Because what they're telling us right now is they're just gonna fight Triple H. That Triple H is gonna fight Orton. Then we'll be find out where we are, WrestleMania. It's just like a, a moron could program this. I mean not even a moron would program better stuff. Well here here's the th- and and I think if I was writing it I would. Um, and I am, yes, I did just call myself a moron. But here's the thing that uh, Cassie said this morning uh, to me, and she was reading an interview with Stephanie McMahon, and she got pissed off because she tends to agree with us on, on these things. She's a okay. little bit more negative on wrestling than, than, than I am. Uh, because but, I think she's but, but right, right on par with me, though? Uh, she's on par. Well, yeah, I would say she's, she's, she's on par. She just thinks it's stupid and doesn't know why I still watch it. Um, so anyway. Here's the question for you. She she read, read what triple what uh blah, 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 Stephanie McMahon had to say in this interview, and Stephanie McMahon was defending 
in an interview to the press, her uh, idea for these general managers, these guest hosts. And she said, yeah. we're in a position right now where we can crop our storylines to match the celebrity that comes in. And she was like, no, you're not. There is no story. What story? What are you yeah. talking about? You're not cropping anything. She's absolutely right. Because she, I, I, don't, I have nothing to add to that. She's absolutely right. There is no story. James, what, if, if, if you have to, from uh, September 96 to December 97, four words, sum me up what the story is in WCW right now. Hogan against Sting. What is this? Patrick, right now, what is the story in WWE? From that, that point in time? Guys fight, what, random <laughs> guys fighting each other magically and over the belt? Congratulations. I believe, if I recall, it was Shawn Michaels versus Camp Cornette, that compelling feud. So, no, no, no. I, I meant right now. If I said 90 Oh, right now. Oh, fuck. There's nothing right going now. on right now. Exactly. Random guys fighting for the belt. Sure, this may have drawn in 1982 when you when people were just like, oh, that's great. I'm going to see Triple H, Greg, or Randy Orton. But guess what? We're more, I mean, not all of us, but we're generally, especially us, who are talking about this for our for ourselves and people like us, a more sophisticated audience. Um, we would like these stories. I'm not saying you change the basis of basic dramatic script writing. What I am saying is, you have some sort of basic script writing here. It's funny because they're getting these guys from Hollywood. Um, I have guys that, 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 that work with me on a daily basis that are trying to break in the script writing industry that know the basics of script writing, and these guys who are writing WWE don't. Because it's funny that they get these guys and they apparently don't know how to tell a story because yeah, they're not telling I, us any story. I think I said this last week about uh, Brendan Brooks, but – we did that interview with Bill Watts, and like I said, I've been watching some of this, Memphis, this uh, Mid-South stuff of late just because I have it, and I never really watched it before, so I figured, what the hell? I mean, sure. there's some brilliant stuff there. I mean, there really is. There there was things where Ted DiBiase was a babyface, but he was kind of, you know, leading Hacksaw Jim Duggan down the path, and, you know, and, and you know Duggan kept getting sneak attacked, and he finds out that, that Ted DiBiase was behind it, which leads to just ridiculous hardcore matches believe it or not, between DiBiase and Duggan. I mean, these guys, these, these stories were just simple. There was a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the end usually ended with one hell of a match. And yeah. it was, and they incorporated backstage segments to a degree. Is it, it true was, that Duggan was a hell of a wrestler? Duggan is a hell, yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you know, based on what we see in the WWF, he was just like a crazy gimmicky brawler, but I hear that back in like the 80s and shit, in the territories, he was actually a pretty damn good wrestler. Well, he wasn't going to give you a drop toll holds into STFs and then, and, and, you know, whatevers, and he wasn't going to do moonsaults, but he was believable because he, you believed that he would just knock the piss out of you. Well, here, here's the thing as far as, um, as, far as uh, the kind of things. I mean, we look at these character tropes, uh, tropes and basic myths that our society has. Why was CM Punk's story so compelling? Because it was the fall of the hero. It's the Anakin Skywalker story. It, it's the supposed moral good guy being drawn into, based on a number of circumstances, being drawn into the dark side. And now CM Punk is there. And they ruin that because on the way to the dark side, he was just easily beaten by a guy from the good side. You don't destroy the villain until he's, he's completely built up. And that's why CM Punk's turn was so fascinating because you watch this guy that was so gung-ho, so good, so, you know, I want to be a positive role model, turn into this, this sinister, this maniacal, this, this guy who now looks down upon people and a false prophet, uh, this, this, this uh, you know, an almost Chris Jericho-like character. And, and it's fascinating to watch a character that you think is moral, that you think is right and stands for the right thing, become this evil, twisted version of himself. And that's why it became so fascinating to a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, wrestling critics. Right, and, and anybody who knows his independent character, is he's basically starting to draw towards that now because... Exactly. He used to cut. He used to cut towards a lot of those promos, where it's basically I'm straight edge, and that means I'm better than you, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and yeah, and it, yeah, and it, it, it's a compelling story. I mean, we we, we like to see this with different, characters. and especially when put up against Jeff Hardy, who we all know has a you know quite a colorful past. Yeah, and 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 it's a, it's a great matchup, and and you can guess what you can completely sympathize with with Punk. Like, to a point, his perspective is he's doing the right thing. He's trying to wrestle uh, uh, the way that he, he likes it. And then, you know, like, people just don't care. And they just and they just don't like him as much. And so he just eventually gives in. He gets frustrated. And if you kept trying to do the same thing and people kept insulting you and mocking you, you would turn on those people. Whether you believe that or not, you would turn on them. And, and 
it's completely justified in the way his character was written. And you know what? I, I mean, I was thinking again back to wrestling, and, and I hate to keep going back to Hulk Hogan examples, but even though the match, and I hate to keep saying this about Hogan matches, but even though the match didn't lead to what it should have, the build-up to Hogan versus Piper the first time around was yeah, brilliant okay. because they told the story perfectly. You know, they've had, oh. they wrestled before, but there never was a finish. Yeah. And the, the thing was, you know, well, let's have the war that will actually finally finish the score, settle the score. And, and there's no nothing like that right now because, you know, every week there's, I don't know, there's everything. Well, and, just, well, also, a key component to that, and uh, I'm going to go on another Hogan compliment, which from me should be considered high praise, but Hogan's heel turn was massively compelling, and James and I have talked about this, what made it so compelling was the concept that you took a character to very much a hero fall of the dark side. And you, you take a guy who is seemingly stood for all these things, and then in the culture that we lived in, we were living in a very cynical, jaded era. Could we really believe that this guy was so nice, that he's saying all this stuff, and then finally he's like, you know, I did it for the money. I did it because I wanted movies. And, 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 you know, the fans turned on me. They booed me when I was trying to do all this thing, so Hogan gives into it. And, and then, then he, his character is instantly compelling. Why did you do this? Why? We want to know more. And the character becomes, it becomes fresh. It becomes real. It becomes three-dimensional. It's very much like Punk. Punk's turn and Hogan's turn executed very differently, but very similar. Hogan had immense success, and obviously the wrestling industry had a lot better ideas back then, so it was a lot more successful than Punk will ever be with this but very similar in, in the ways they did that. Absolutely. And, and I mean, you, like you said, Hogan even came out there, and, and a lot of people don't remember this, but in his Bash the Beach speech, said, and the reception I got, I did it all this for the kids, I did it all for the charities, and the reception I got when I walked out here, you people make me sick. Yeah, and guess what? Guess what? Whether you like him or not, he's justified. The character is justified. I'm not saying you can't have completely evil characters. They're okay. But how much more is it when you see, like, you know what? That makes sense. This guy was trying to do the right thing, whether you agree with him or not, whether you like him or not, and he gets booed. Everybody gets frustrated. You know, everybody gets upset, and that's what happened to this character. He's like, he's like, you know, I know I made the right decision. I know he turned, and, and, and it's justified. He's a real person. He's not something just doing like, oh, we need a heel. Let's turn him heel. They 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 did it, and the character in, in the sense of the of the story, it made sense. It was believable. We all bought it. So the matches become more compelling. The storylines become more compelling. That's character development. Yep, and I mean we're almost at, we're out of time here, guys. We, we but, are uh, out of time, yes. So we better finish this up. But you know, the, it's it's simple, one hundred and one storytelling, one hundred and one living in society, and, and this is what we should be. You know, look at what there is. The, the VCR was created because people wanted to watch porn, and I wish there was a more novel concept to it. But in reality, the porn industry created the VCR. That's the oh. truth. They created the the. The, uh, I, 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 I agree with that. I mean, also, people did want to watch tape shows and watch videos, but yes, yes, you are. Yeah, well, this yeah. is what I'm saying, though. They, things like this were created because people wanted something. And, sure, and, I agree. and we're still going in that direction where people want things. They want more and more. Right now, the in things to want are you know, new ways of getting the same things you already have. Like, oh, I want a flat screen TV that looks exactly the same as an old TV that I have, but doesn't the picture look better? Not really, no. Well, well, but but the but the point you're saying is correct. Human beings will always want something. So what do you do in any storytelling, professional wrestling, in film? You make them want something. Is it the protagonist beating their boss? Maybe. Is it the protagonist achieving a goal like winning the title? Is it the protagonist proving something to a friend or winning a woman? I don't know. There's all sorts of different stories you can tell. Vince McMahon is not telling a story. That's the bottom line. He needs to start doing these things we're talking about. Um, this is this is not three kids talking about wrestling here. We're all adults that have jobs in the real world, live on our own, and have degrees and education. Okay, I in fact I have a degree. I have a degree and I I've taken playwriting classes. I have a theatrical degree. James has a uh, I believe communications degree. We're all we're all very intelligent people. These are basic concepts, and he's not has a them. degree in political science, don't you, Pat? Exactly. I mean, these, 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 these these aren't some some, some idiots telling you. I mean. This is just basic things that we want to be utilized in something that we've loved as, as kids and at some point adults, and we can still love. It's just becoming very, very hard after that show. And I'm just pleading with, with, with the, I know people, I know some of them listen to the show because I, they, they do have feelers, and it's just like pleading with them to start 
you know, to just start doing these basic concepts. The the, the bottom line with, with wrestling is the same now as it was uh, 10 years ago. And, and the bottom line is it, people wanted to see things back then, and they paid to see it. And, and now we're not getting that. There's no competition to warrant these, these ratings things because – Oh, well, you know, we'll pop a rating if we actually give them Triple H versus Randy Orton tonight. Well, no, you won't. Same amount of people will be watching if you made it, you know, uh, I don't know who. You know, uh, MVP versus John Cena in the main event. Same amount of people will watch because that's where we're at. Yeah, and, 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 and I mean, uh, James, uh, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you go in a second, but, but it's funny because we, we just see the course. What if, I'm not, I'm not writing the rest of the storyline, but what if, what if on, uh, you there? Yeah. I'm here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, what if, uh, what if, what if Triple H, uh, beats up John Cena in the next pay-per-view and join, uh, then in the next show and joins Randy Orton? Uh, we don't know why. I don't know what it would lead, but wouldn't that be compelling? Because it's finally a twist in this staying quiet. I don't know what it would mean, but, but why, wouldn't that compel you to watch the next episode to find out why that happened? Yeah. I mean, if, maybe, if, maybe if that happened at SummerSlam? Yeah, maybe, or, or whatever. Maybe it's not the best idea, but it'd make you want to watch the next show. Yeah, well, that kind of stuff is good. I remember when, uh, just a few months ago, when Joe turned heel and joined the main event mafia, that uh, obviously it didn't go to a very good place for anybody who saw Victory Road. But, uh, yeah, it, it it made me compelled to tune into Impact the next week. Sure, yeah. So I think we're out of time, am I right? We are. Oh, we're we are, way out of time. We're about we are way minutes. out of time. We're going to wrap this up, guys. But uh, let me just make this p- point clear. <laughs> It, it, we can go on for days about this, and we will. And, and the bottom line is, to some degree, you just have to accept it as what it is. And, and you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a room in my house dedicated to a tape library to where I can go back and watch over and over again the stuff that I remember that I love this business for and, and that I always love this business for. But the bottom line is, what I say to people and what I say to you and, what, and the way I'll close this is, I love what wrestling is or what wrestling can be. But I don't necessarily love what I'm seeing on my TV every Monday night. I agree. I completely agree. I think wrestling can be so much more, and it's not, it's not doing that. Um, yeah, I, I, honestly, I think this is a really good conversation that we had about, like, just fundamental problems. And why we, maybe we're, Normally, we do a lot of shouting stuff, and it's mostly me and Nick. For, and a lot of it's for entertainment purposes. But a lot of it's true, but I think we're really nuts about a lot of things that, that need to be done, you know? Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, Pat, if you want to hang us, hang us up, and Patrick's actually producing us tonight, and we will uh, be back next week. We'll have a couple guests for you. Bull Payne, formerly of the Global Wrestling Federation, AWA, WCW, WWF. Uh, this guy's been in Japan. This guy's been everywhere. Nobody knows who he is. Uh, one of my favorites, because he kind of just was always this kind of hard worker, never really made it as a huge name, but he was everywhere. And he, I'd love to get him on there. Uh Van Hammer might be joining us next week. We're trying to get that settled up and, and figured out. Uh, Memphis legend Austin Idol might be joining us. Uh, Nydia might be joining us, and Dawn Marie might be joining us. So we're not obviously not going to have all these people coming on next week, but I'm sure one of these guests, maybe two, will be joining us next week here on the Interactive Interview. And with that, good night, guys. I'll see you all next week. Okay. Take it easy, guys. Bye-bye. This is Interactive Wrestling Radio. 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 Oh, for us. Featuring the Interactive Interview. 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 Oh, yeah. Formerly the Blaze. 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 The Blaze Rock. You're a maniac, so what you gonna do when the Blaze of Mania runs wild on you? On WrestlingEpicenter.com. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. Don't get off. And now we shamelessly name drop from our history.
The wrestling epicenter would like to apologize for the following. Arriba la raza. Arriba la raza. Hey, Hello, ladies. <laughs> Hey guys, we had a lovely conversation. First lady, absolutely. Oh, look at me. She's so kooky. <laughs> I'll be there. Where else? Interactive Wrestling Radio. Wrestling. Oh my god, you win! Love being interactive. Whoa! Let's discuss the mission! I was not shooting yeah. that. That almost missed my fans. <laughs> Breaking neck. I got two words for you. Um, yeah. I've heard a lot about you guys. Yeah. Here. Let's go. I see my language. You're gonna go over the shot. Yeah. Let's see them now. We're gonna get a mini. No, no. That was great. It's gonna be cool. Woo! What it's all about. The purest point of the living legend. Instead of statement, I'm talking to you. In the land of extreme. Nevermore. Interactive. I'm not just the best. Interactive. Interview with a plastic. You earn the right. Nobody. Thank you very much. Controversy creates cash. Professional wrestling. Memphis wrestling. The guy on fire. And that guy. We were sexy. What a show. One and only. Interactive wrestling radio. Wrestling epicenter. Interactive interview. We took care of the business. This isn't ballet. We are huge. We're just all over. You're where it's at. You better recognize who's the best. Make sure you tune in each and every week. I'll come out of your computer. Knock down your door and turn it on for you. I'm going to kick your stick and tape in. And that's the bottom line. Get dark. Have a nice day. It's showtime. Don't forget to like and subscribe.